Hey everybody, Monday again, and welcome back. It's like Groundhog Day, but it's like the best Groundhog Day ever. Many American <laughs> Part 3. An excellent way to end 2021. This will be the final show of the year. Wow. End of season three, which I can just pretend it's a new season anytime I want. So it's the end of season <laughs> three. But welcome well, back, we Manny. Fun. We met we better curse a lot and tell story, make up stories Fuck and all that. Yeah. <laughs> well, make me make me up a story. What have you been up to in the last couple of weeks? Uh man, I've been good. Just same old, same old, mixing away, you know, just uh having fun. I'm gonna take a you know, take off earlier this year. Um um but yeah, it's been fun, man. It's been uh you know, reopening out here and then new variant and, you know, you know, all the, all the good stuff that 2021 brought to us, you know, yeah. <laughs> more, you know, global pandemics and fucking and more records. Yeah. Well, good. I'm glad you got the records to go with it because everybody's got the pandemic, but not everybody's got records. So <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Well, look, man, I want to jump in because we were talking about this before we went live that we're going to touch on a few records because there's still some like major shit that we got to talk about. But then I want to jump back and get into all of the other things that you're doing because you're doing a lot of other things. Among other things, you're sitting in the studio that you own. We spent a lot of time talking about the when you got your room there and whatever, but you were booking a room. Now <laughs> yeah. people are booking rooms from you, which is amazing. So <laughs> so we'll come back to that. But where we left off last time was we had just finished talking about uh, 2005 when you mixed 56 records, which I still <laughs> find absolutely astonishing. But 2006 was uh, the John Mayer record, Continuum. Gosh, that long ago. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, so 15 years ago, which is insane. But that was that record you were super involved in, right? I was, yes. It was uh, Michael Brower and myself, yep. <clears throat> and that's when I met Michael, which was amazing because we had a uh, – I feel like we have similarities in sound because I remember hearing some of his mixes and going, wow, that's like – that's how I hear things. And it just so happened that um, – you know, we both ended up on the same album, and and I think you know, listen, it's to me, it's it's such a great album. Uh, you know, when the stars align with an artist that's trying to get away from that singer songwriter pop image, you know, because he, you know, so looking for credibility uh, as an artist, and and for for Michael, I I think he was coming off Coldplay maybe, yeah. and I'm coming off like a lot of R and B and hip hop. Um, and and kind of doing this sort of hybrid of you know blues but yet pop but yet you know i remember consciously uh you know trying to make it sound like if the roots was backing him up you know and steve jordan i mean listen one of the greatest drummers alive he uh the way he co-produced that album with john was very very you know, just with a lot of uh, a lot of booty, you know, a lot of like big kicks and big bass and stuff. So I remember the very first song I mixed was Gravity. I don't know if I told you the story on that song. Mm. Uh, I'll tell you a two minute quick. Uh, when I first met John, um, we get in the studio. He uh, Steve is a he's in the south of France with uh, Clapton. <laughs> this other guy named Clapton. Uh, so he, uh, you know, I put the, the song up. It was Gravity. Um, and I remember thinking, fuck, what? I didn't, I, listen, I did not know much about John Mayer as an artist besides your body as a wonderland. And that was it. I didn't know much about him. Uh, so then for me coming in fresh, no, just a fresh, fresh perspective on an artist that I kind of knew about, uh, you know, I start going on the faders, I start mixing, I start, you know, kind of getting into it. And I remember the drums being really fucking in your face. I remember that snare, like wanting to, I was mixing it like a hip hop record, right? Not knowing if that's what he wanted or not knowing anything. So um, at night, John comes in, first time I met him, he comes in, I play him the mix and he's like, fuck man, thank you. This is great. Call Steve, you know? And, you know, he's like, hey, man, I love it. This is great. You know, he probably obviously didn't know who I was or whatever. He's like, man, we need Manny to do more songs, right? So then the second time he hung up, goes and, asked, you know, asked me to play it again, play it again. And he goes, 
man, what do you have on my vocal? I'm like, shit, I don't know. Let me <laughs> let me see. <laughs> and I just, and I looked at the channel and I'm like, fuck. And then I go in the tools and I'm like, man, I don't I don't have anything on your vocal. And he was like, whoa, whoa, what do you mean you don't have anything? I actually don't have anything. Like you don't have a reverb or a delay or harmonize. I'm like, no, it's dry. <laughs> And I couldn't believe that either. It wasn't even a conscious thing. It was just more of a natural, like, this is how it felt good. And he's like, really? I, man, I, I, and this is the insecurity kicks in for as in every artist, right? And he was like, really? You don't think we need something on it? So at this point, your left, your left brain is engaged because you should, right? Yeah. I'm like, I don't think so, man. I, 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 it feels great to me. I don't know if you need it, but, you know, listen, of course, we'll try whatever you want. No, 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 leave it like that. Let, let me just take a CD and take it in the car, right? So fast forward, I don't know, six months. We finished the album. He's shooting a video for Waiting on the World Change. And he calls me from the video shoot. He's like, man, you know, I'm playing the album in the back while I'm doing the video and in between takes. And, you know, Gravity, man, I, I just want to revisit that. Can you send me two versions? I want to do one with like a 480 like reverb and then AMS reverb. And let me just listen to those. I'm like, okay, cool. So I sent him two versions, one with, you know, and calls me back. He's like, man, I think I like the AMS reverb on it. Let's just, let's just stick with that. And I'm like, all right, cool. So he plays the album, right? He's got it done and plays it for Donnie Einer in his office, right? The president of the label at the time. So Gravity comes on and he's like, you know, and he's telling me this story and he's pretending he's Donnie. He's like, hey, man, wait, wait, wait. And he yells out of his office, calls for his assistant. It's like, bring me that CD, the Gravity CD, blah, blah, blah. And puts in the CD and he goes, that's your record. Don't fuck with it. And it was the first mix, right? And he goes, really? That's what, what's, it's different, man. What you got is different. This is the record. Put this one out. So then he calls me. He's like, hey, I just, I'm leaving Donnie's office. And he wants to put Gravity the way we had it before. And I got to tell you, it makes me really uncomfortable, but I'm going to roll with it. And then you fast forward five years later, and uh, he always brings us up like, man, listen, that's the moment I try to fight what was supposed to be and not what it was meant to be, you know, like from your gut. And from that moment on, he, you know, it was gr- a great relationship because he started to trust, you know, and and because I, you know, I didn't make that decision based on anything. But I mean, if you analyze it and break it down on why mm-hmm. that works is shit gravity you know it's fucking it's heavy it's it's supposed to kind of hit you you know the first word that comes out gravity should be right in your face and it should be heavy and it should be it should kind of round you know fill the spectrum and and that snare and that kick is just so three things snare kick and boom gravity the moment you start adding any sauce to it then gravity goes kind of away from so I mean, again, when you analyze it, it kind of makes sense. But at the time, for an artist to be like, wait a minute, this just doesn't, you know, that's not the right way to do it. It just, it's a constant reminder that there's no fucking rules, you know, whatever, whatever feels right. You just yeah. Go. And I think for me, the key to that story is when he asks you what's on the voice, you were like, check it out. You'll never believe it, man. It's totally dry. <laughs> like you had no idea. You put the vocal up at some point and it was working. And so you didn't touch it. Exactly. Uh, end of story and you don't yep. remember doing it it's not no. it's not about anything other than what it felt like you know and that's that's the you know I, I like to think that that's more my approach you know as i'm i'm as needed type of you know i'm not you know hey the the kick should have this the vocal should have that the bass sh- should should have would have could have you know it's like hey just go with a fresh perspective every time you I throw faders. I always say when I throw the faders up, let's just, you know, sometimes I don't even like to listen to the song beforehand um, just because I want that emotion just to kind of take over that, that sort of right brain working your gut, you know, and then, then maybe you analyze it a little better. And, uh, but it's just that I've always thought, you know, when you kind of, you know, whether you're in the box or not, you, you're doing, making things based on emotion, right? Making changes and decisions based on emotion. Uh, sometimes that's easier said than done, right? Because sometimes you may be having you may be having a bad day, and you maybe you got into an argument 
with your partner or your kids or road rage coming in the tough streets of LA, you know, you never know. It, or you may be feeling amazing because it's a Friday and you're going to go away for the weekend. Whatever that emotion you have, you internal emotion, you know, that's going to reflect whether you like it or not on your mix. And, and I think the key is knowing yourself on what state of mind you're in um, and how you, how you manipulate yourself. I, I was going to say how you mind fuck yourself. I don't know <laughs> if you know what's on here. But. Yeah, man. Uh, yeah, so that's, you know, it's all about manipulating the uh, your mindset and helping you get there, you know. And, uh, and sometimes it helps you and sometimes it can get in the way. And when, when that's, you know, when does that help you or hurt you type of thing, you know. And I think it's more of a psychology uh uh, game that you play with yourself on every single song you yeah. work on, and you'd play it differently if you mix the same song again from scratch. Hundred percent. The first thing you do sends you down whatever road you're going to be on for that mix. Yep. It's, it's like I can imagine if you're playing a basketball game. There's no two basketball games ever the same. There's... No, man. Think about double headers in baseball. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you get crushed by 20 runs and come back and crush the other team by 20 and all you've done is change pitchers and they were all pitching well that day like, it makes no sense all the different variables right you know all yeah. the different pitcher to the state of mind to the, the the sun or shade or lights and i mean there could be whether it's 20 or twenty thousand different variables that you know and each one may be just a tiny brick you know uh but you stack enough of those bricks right and that becomes a, a a wall <laughs> yeah it does become a wall that is yeah. what you get if you stack a bunch of bricks or you get a pile of bricks a pile of bricks if yeah, you don't well. use mortar it's just a pile of bricks yeah you know back in the day you know well but that's not true either they got the dry fit walls. Yeah, man. in <laughs> fact we got a we got a well and it's all dry fit stone there's no mortar in there so i i'm talking shit as I often do. But I, I think it is. It's really important. And I think like one of my favorite ways to think about it is like for so long in science, they thought like if you knew everything, you would know what was coming next. Like the way to predict the future is if you knew everything that had happened up until that moment, because it was all based on rules. And then all the quantum physics dudes are like, no, nope, no, nope, completely <laughs> fucking random. <laughs> There's some possibilities. It could be. And that's what's happening all day, every day in any creative endeavor. In, Absolutely. And, you know, and I'm not what... saying it's because of quantum physics. So in the comments, go easy. I'm just, <laughs> I just, there is so much random stuff. Like the phone rings that will completely change your perspective on the next thing you're going to do on that song. Absolutely. You know, and that's why, you know, sometimes I have the TV on because that kind of gets me in and out, in and out, in and out. And that's why I tend to do a lot of sports because you don't follow a storyline. You just follow a score. Um, so it's much easier not to pay attention to it. But whenever I feel like I need a like a split second mental break, boom, I look at it. I may turn the commentator on for maybe two seconds and I go right back to it. It's almost like a, a constant reset, constant reset. So you so- never that bubble you know so let me ask you a question because you've got guys prepping your sessions and getting them laid out on the console so you can walk in and just start throwing faders as you call it and i know we talked about this earlier but i don't remember how specific we got and i didn't just rewatch parts one and two so if i'm making you repeat yourself i'm sorry but what i'm curious about is how far are they supposed to take it are they just trying to match the rough or they know kind of where you want to start and like when you're throwing up those faders, what would it be if it was just faders up? So right, so now it's really important for us to get the rough that everyone's approved, right? So label, manager, producer, artist, whatever that is, we get that. My guys get the session, and then they now make sure that arrangement-wise, not sonically, but arrangement-wise, that matches what we have, right? Because Eight out of ten times, they send us wrong files. Right, and it's happened before where I mix it, and they and I spend a day on the mix, and they get it back, and they're like, "Oh, someone sent you the wrong session." I'm like, "Fuck!" <laughs> so now, <laughs> so now we make sure that every part matches that arrangement, and we make sure that if some idiot took a, a ozone nine that was heavily, you know, influencing the outcome of that rough, and they took it off, 
I need that back on. Right. You know, no so sonically, point. they're trying to get at least in the ballpark. Yeah, yeah. Because I don't want it to be exactly, exactly the same either. I just want to have the tools and let me fuck with those tools, right? Uh, so if someone put in those on nine, I want to start from there. Sorry. Um, uh, I, I really want to start from there. Yeah. So, uh, so that's what they sometimes they spend hours, days on getting this stuff back in, man. It's like the the lost art of engineering and setting up things, you know. Yeah. So, so that's that's what they do now. Once we've done that, once we have the arrangement in there, because sometimes they have to even arrange it, you know, because uh, you know we just finished this Juice World album and it was like crazy crazy because it came from everywhere and you know rest in peace he's not around so so it was a lot of politics involved as well so when uh now that now that's on the desk i mean not that they have the arrangement and it's there they you know now they put it all on the desk and i tend to like my drums here my vocals there synths and effects and now I just come in and push faders. So that's like the best part where before I used to have to set up my own sessions and all that. Now I just want to come in and just kind of, you know, feel it out. And uh, I listen to the rough, obviously, because, you know, now we live in the world of roughs, which is great yeah. most of the time, because now you have a where to go as opposed to going with a blindfold, which is great too, but it, it just takes a lot longer to get there. Uh, so I see the snapshot. Oh, okay, this is what I think I'm going to improve on. This is what I'm going to leave because I think it's good or this is what I'm going to change, right? And I, I kind of have that in the back of my mind and I start mixing. Every once in a while, I listen to the rough. Oh, okay, well, what's the luffs? What's leveled? Oh my gosh, they're listening to this really, really hyped rough and I can't get it that loud. So then I'm, I'm not going to even listen to the luffs. I'm just going to go with gut and feel and then... You know, we'll give them a hyped version at the end of, so that they're used to listen to what they're used to level wise. Right. But feel wise will be different. So so that's really the, uh, you know, the the the, uh, the approach. Uh, well, my guys get it to where I can now push favors. So two things about that. One, is there any way you could do a do not disturb on your computer? Because your your notifications yeah. are actually louder <laughs> than you. <laughs> I'm getting blown up. Let me. Uh, let me Sorry. If you that. and if you got to get them, you got to get them. That's totally cool. Just they're super loud. Boom. Yeah. Here we go to the uh, to for this evening. Done. Sorry. Ta da. No. Ta -da. And so, but do you have like? I mean, because obviously you've got sends and you got all the buses. Are those set up with things that you use a lot? So yep. you've sort of got a template built into the console, but the source yep, material yep. is set up to be the rough, right? Exactly. I know that send one is my 480, send two is my AMS. I know that bus right. 46, 48 are my vocal background chains. Bus 46 is my lead. Uh, you know, I have uh, my 1176 on 27, which is usually my lead. On 26, I got a CL1B so that I can choose which one I want to use. And, uh, and then, uh, so that's sort of like, I don't, you know, like we talked about templates, but that's sort of the basic setup. And then, you know, and then we, every, you know, every mix obviously yeah. is different. And sometimes I'll, uh, I'm playing with a digital patch bay right now. Uh, uh, that's amazing. And we're kind of kicking the tires, but I won't say what it is yet. Cause I'm still kind of, you know, but I'm loving what I'm hearing where, where I can just access all my outboard gear, you know, digitally and all that. So, but yeah, I'm still you know, I'm still a believer in user and, you know, analog gear, you know, yeah. maybe less and less, but I still, you know, I, I always say I turn around and I'm like, man, I'm looking for something. It's not giving me what I want. And I just look and go, oh, let me try this. And all of a sudden it just magically just happened. You know? It's a little different than a pop-up menu. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also it's the, I mean, you know, I, obviously I'm a huge advocate of mixing fully digitally because it's, it's all I do, yeah. but like yeah. the thing, the analog gear has is that chaos. It has that quantum stuff. It's just, it's different every day. Every yeah. unit is different and yeah. that can be a good thing. And it de depends on the humidity and the temperature of the room too. So yeah, <clears throat> for that constant, change it, it's kind of exciting you know because you kind of never know what you're going to get and that's and again talk about the emotion right you, there's a different emotion that comes it may not be again good or bad but it is a difference of emotion so now you're 
again, going back to getting in and out of that sort of zone, now you're kind of out of it, and then you're back in with this slightly different tone, right? And you play, and then you can run with that. And it may work, it may not work, but at least you're aware. Now there's that push-pull, that interaction you have with the song, whereas, you know, sometimes I find myself just staring at a screen and I'm not doing it based on emotion, but based on visual waveforms or, or GUIs or whatever it is. So right. I try my, I try very, very hard not to do that. That's why, you know, like you can see the size of my monitor. Yeah. <laughs> Like time, it's time people come in. Like, how can you work on this? Well, because I'm not working on that. I'm working on this. Exactly. Yeah. No, no, that's it. And I had, you know, listen, I had a giant fucking monitor on the side, and and I felt like I was mixing with one ear because I was always staring. At right. It. <laughs> right. Because uh, I didn't have it in front of me. I had it to the side. Uh, and at one point, I was like, man, I'm spending too much time looking at things and not hearing and feeling them. And that's the pros and cons of everything right digital is great because you can boom boom recalls and all that uh, unlimited options right that's amazing but also you know we're we tend to do things from the left brain now and more technical things than more emotion it's almost like when you close your eyes and you eq you know fuck i still do that i still love doing that and the moment it hits you, you that's where you stop yeah and whatever Whatever frequency that is, it doesn't even matter. Where you have, you know, an EQ in front of you, a plug-in, you're seeing what you're doing, you know? You have to. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. But, I mean, it, it, that's still... Uh, people just have to also get over themselves. Like, they worry about, oh, am I allowed to boost plus 12? Yeah, like, of course. Well, yeah, because maybe it's, like, 18 dB too quiet. Of course you are. Exactly. boost whatever you need to boost yeah, yeah. yeah. it's you, uh, you lose in that process you kind of you got to be super super disciplined to to ignore some of those things you know because you know we grew up with analog well it doesn't matter maybe more is better just because it's nice distortion it's not nasty yeah. like over you know saturation or Nowadays, there's some nasty things that happen in these plugins that you can't really. So naturally, people are not pushing it as hard as they probably could. You know? Yeah, and, but I think to me, I think oh, sorry, cat coming and going. Um, I think the one of the most important things, though, is what we touched on earlier about not remembering what was going on with John's voice. However you're mixing, as long as you can get into a state where you don't remember everything you've done, then that means you've been creative and you've been listening yeah, yeah and sometimes yeah that's why having these conversations are really interesting because i'm it t like we said before it just takes me back and i'm trying to think of what i would have done because it's honestly it's not even conscious you know it's yeah. almost like okay, what's what's gonna get me there okay these plugins can help me get there this piece of gear this you know stereo bus or it, you just hear certain things and you're constantly trying to reach that and and these are just tools to help you reach whatever you have that you need to get out almost, whether it's because you are you listen to the rough and you're trying to either mimic that or be influenced by that or, or inspired or doing the complete opposite. Um, so those, again, those are the things that are going through your head. Uh, I remember, listen, well, and I'm sure you've been through it where you mix for 12 hours straight and you feel like you fucking ran a marathon, right? Because yeah. I mean, because you're mentally always, always on, like, and you're not only on, but you're like sprinting, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, and exhausting, uh, mental, you know, and that's that's something that we don't really talk about enough, you know, like the mental uh, uh, agitation, I guess is the word or whatever we want, you know, it's 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 it can be draining, and uh, and and some some you know we all kind of keep going and knowing that we're mentally tired and we're going to make bad decisions now. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I've tried like every once in a while, I'll try to sort of narrate in my head what it is I'm doing. Like most of the time, it's just you're in it, you're doing it. You're not really thinking about it, but sort of as an exercise and it's impossible. Like the language can't keep up with how fast you're switching your focus and moving around and doing things. And 
it is a, a gigantic juggling act. And I think that that is for younger mixers. It's one of the most important things is to get to that stage to get off the kind of checklist of like, all right, now I better go check my high pass filters on stuff. Cause now you're just yeah. thinking about high pass filters. You're not thinking about the bass right, or the acoustic right, right, guitar right. and you know, how right. it fits into the world. And it's also, I think sometimes people feel, I, I definitely have seen comments where it's like, man, you shouldn't have a template. You got it every, every mix from scratch. It's like mm -hmm. the mental energy it would take you to mm -hmm. rebuild everything from scratch on every mix, you'd never get a mix done. Yeah, you know, I think it's also important to define templates, you know, uh, because templates could be, for me, a template, you know, could be, okay, a drum bus, a bass bus, a vocal bus, right? Like stuff that, and you put all the same plugins, right? That could be a template for, you know, to me, I'm sort of against that. But a template for me is like we said, I have, AMS on Send yeah. Two, Brady on Send One, and and maybe I have my you know my my plugin as a, a send return with a dedicated you know uh, bus going into it type of thing. To me, those are setups, yeah. but not templates. So we, I think it's important to define that because one one time I said, hey, don't use templates, and they're you know I think. I forget what it was, and everyone went like, "Whoa, what do you mean? <laughs> no <laughs> templates? What are you talking about?" And I'm like, "Hang on, hang on." Let's define what that means. For and that's my definition of a template. It's like if you're running it through your background chain and you have the same plugins on that, then that to me you may not want to do that because you know not two background tracks are exactly the same. So you may want to play with different colors, different plugins. Yeah, you have your go tos and maybe have them inactive or something. But uh, try different things to kind of get you out of your comfort zone. So I, I always believe that once you get comfortable, once you come in and start doing shit just as a, like a very, like a robot, then you got to change things. You yeah. almost got to be uncomfortable and you got to get used to being uncomfortable because that's when you're going to challenge yourself to, here we go. I'm going to use the same kick and snare bus and I have the 2044 on the kick and the 1073 on the kick for every fucking mix. Well, then it becomes very monotonous, and that's that's when you start losing. You know, what? Why am I using the same two things on the kick for every kick? If I, I can honestly say that out of all the songs I mix, I maybe ninety eight percent of them are new sounds, different sounds, or very seldom will it be the same sound, the yeah. recycled sound. So therefore, why am I using the same thing? You know. So I think that that's. To me, that's the definition or just how I separate a template and not, you know. And I think from, from most of the templates I've seen from people who are doing this, you know, for a living and are, are doing decently well at it, the better the mixer, the more of their template is parallel and may not even get used. Like, I mean, I don't know. I've probably got three or four plugins that are actually like, hey, audio will go through these definitely on their way to the mix bus. And it's like it's a de -esser. you know, right. it's but there's tons and tons of parallel stuff. And some of those chains are really simple. Some of them are super complicated and I'd never want to build them again because I don't remember what the hell I did. But right. I named right. it something and it's on a send. And if I yeah. want it, I got it. And yeah. that's... And I think yeah, I think that's the difference, you know, like you have you have your sort of arsenal of things that you may want to use if, if they're there and you have them on the side. That, that to me, I don't know if I would call that a template, though. Maybe maybe you would. I don't know. To me, that's part of your setup, you know, but uh, to me, templates, for whatever reason, right or wrong, I think of a template as something that's repetitive that, that you're going to use right. over over and over again even though it's the different song so to me i was always discouraged that and like don't use the same you know stereo compressor on the on your synths or or don't use that fucking eq on your bass all the time it's to me the, the then what happens is you that you do that long enough you just become it becomes a job it just, you just show up to do a job and it's and then you sound just not inspired right think. and it doesn't allow each song to do its own thing as much yep 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 absolutely yeah all right well i'm glad we cleared that shit up <laughs> guys templates fuck yeah <laughs> well calling them sets i mean and, and i think you're right because the you know the word template implies that it will be the same like you're always basing right. on the same thing but it's it's just a collection of tools 
Yep. That's yep. all it is. And it's a collection of things that are time saving enough that you can stay creative instead of like, oh, right, I got to go build that reverb again, yeah, which has, yeah, yeah. you know, a filter before it and a de-esser and it's got a pre-delay and a different plugin and then it's got some distortion after. Like, yeah. you know, like the stuff you built into your signature mm -hmm. plugins, you yeah. did it so that you wouldn't have to build that chain from scratch <laughs> every time. That's fine. Yeah. And that's part, of, that's part of your, yeah, your setup, I guess, yeah. right? Yeah. That's a setup that you may want to use uh, at a later time or when, whenever, you know, that inspiration, that delay, that cool delay that you want to throw or um, as opposed to, you know, I'm going to do this on every kick, snare, bass, vocal, you know, background. Right. All right. So back to some records here. So we talked about the John Mayer record, and it was interesting you mentioned that you felt as though you'd been doing a lot of hip hop and R&B leading up to it. And were you consciously looking to get more varied genre wise yeah, at that point? A hundred percent. You know, I always, you know, I always thought back, you know, back in the day, I'm I, look, we're all music fans. I, you know, I, I listened to from freaking, you know, from Tool to freaking Kanye. To yeah, I mean, your your list is, it's all over the place you know, <laughs> in a really I'm, good I'm, way. I'm a music fan, you know, and I always, I, I was always bummed to, you know, back back then when I was starting out, if you wanted a rock mix or, you know, alternative rock, whatever that was at the time, you went to CLA, right? That That's what it was. And uh, if you wanted uh, this type of record, you went to that guy. And I never understood that. I and I never liked that. I'm like, fuck, man. We're we're too, you know. We're music heads. You know, why would you? It's almost like having a musician. Like a jazz musician can probably play three chords and be a pop musician as well. You know, so why are you boxing us in? So I always, you consciously, I've always wanted to do different genres, just because, again, just because I'm a music fan, and I'm and I started doing this as a fan and got really really lucky that uh, people actually started paying me to do this <laughs> i'm like hell yeah and uh so i was always trying to challenge myself into doing things that people had you know they had a perception of that i, I couldn't work on stuff like I, i'll never forget when i you know i got a call hey man have you ever mixed like live drums I'm like are you fucking kidding me <laughs> like <laughs> like well, even, even if I didn't what, what, does it matter I mean like to me it was so natural to mix mix stuff whether it's program or live or you ever mix a, a, a string section before a live string section I'm like oh my gosh <laughs> so uh I always wanted to do you know I wanted I wanted to be a genre list mixer you know uh and this is you know I'm talking about 20 years ago, 22 years, 25, when man, there, there were no, there were very defined genres at the time. Uh, nowadays, I feel like it's genre, finally genreless. Uh, you know, you can mix a country album and then go and do a Metallica album. You know, and, and that's the beauty of of being in, in these days where we can, you know, we can do different genres. So for me, it was always like I want to do different things. You know. I've always been conscious, and I told my manager at the, you know, like, even if we, even if I mix for free, I wanted to, like, you know, that's what kept me going, you know, as a fan. And I think that's when you have longevity in any career, you have to, you have to really kind of get out of your comfort zone. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, it it worked for you a little bit. <laughs> 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 so I mean, we all right. Let, let's take a, a little detour to to 2010 and just talk about Bruno Mars because I believe that's the first time mm -hmm. you're with Bruno. But you're again pretty involved, right? Yeah. Yep. So let let's hear that wow. that story. Yeah. yeah, you know, Bruno was uh, man. He was just a songwriter at the time. I went to see him at uh, Molly Malone's on Fairfax. <laughs> There must have been ten people there, man. It was, and I, you know, when I saw him live, I was like, "Gosh, this guy's one of the most talented individuals I've have ever seen." I remember saying this, and uh, and there were ten people out there, man. And between sets, they were outside smoking a cigarette. And I'm like, I go, Bruno, that was one of the best shows I've ever seen. Oh man, thank you, man. You know, I don't know, man. I don't know. People just don't get it, and blah blah blah. He was on sign at the time. And how did you know about him to go see the show? Well, because because uh, so funny enough, the label had called me to help produce a Brandy song, 
and they're like, hey, there's this guy named, uh, you know, these producers, they're super young, and we want someone a little more experienced to kind of guide them through this production because we're not 100% happy with it. And, uh, and then we took the meeting, and it was Bruno and Phil, you know, and, and they were wanting me to kind of produce stuff with them. And I'm like, fuck, this stuff is fine. And at the time, it was that song Billionaire uh, was with Travi, and he had done... Um, what was uh uh the uh beautiful beautiful girls all over the uh what's his name the artist fuck i'm spacing on his name and people are gonna be like duh but uh you know uh bob sorry thank uh so so we uh so i had worked on that song and that's how you know and he was the featured artist but before that that's how i met him uh through the label them asking me to produce with them and you know i'd never know not that i don't have the desire to produce but i just always wanted to mix so i mixed their song for brandy and you know it you know it got placed it was one of their first placements and all and we just became friends but i remember them playing records and thinking fuck this stuff is so good and then he's like oh yeah we got you know i'm an artist too and i was like okay and that's how i and i ended up being friends with him and phil and you know, would see him play local gigs. And then he, uh, I'll never forget at the parking lot here at Larrabee, he's like, hey, man. Uh, and this was maybe a couple weeks after the Molly Malone show. Because I was like, man, hang in there. You know, that, that talk, like, hang in there, bro. It's going to happen. Just hang in there. And we were in the parking lot, and he's like, he goes, Manny, Atlantic is going to make me an offer, bro. I'm like, oh, shit. There you go. Congrats. And, you know, hey, the rest is history, you know, and um, and I worked on the first couple of albums with them. The first album was a collection of just songs that they had written in the last few years. Uh, uh, and then the second one, you know, that was an art, an orthodox. Uh, that, that album was just now him becoming an artist. And that was fun because if you listen to that album, again, it was a lot of different sub-genres in one. And, it, and I'll never forget someone from Kiss FM, I believe, came over and listened to it and she just didn't get it she's like man it's all over the place and we're like yeah exactly that's exactly <laughs> what we want <laughs> you know and uh at the time people were not getting it uh but you know listen he's one of the most talented artists i've ever been in the studio with and uh you know and he's very you know he knows exactly exactly what he wants and, and at the time he let at least let me experiment with things like locked out of heaven I remember doing things that, not consciously, but just trying to get to that, like like we were saying er earlier, like how do we get to that thing that we're hearing? And I just wasn't able to achieve it. And I remember putting a multi-band and I was automating a multi-band in the mix, which is, you know, I've never done that before. I, I still don't do it, you know, like <laughs> hardly ever. It can fuck you up. Um, but it was one of those where it just felt natural and, and that song, you know in particular it's i see i hear it as a three-part song and you know but how do you make three songs into one and feel like it's the same and the kick changes and the it goes four on the floor his hooks kind of down hooks you know instead of uplifting hooks um so all the challenges of how do you keep you know the listener kind of engaged or you know up to this point the hooks were like up they, you know it was like the biggest part of the song i remember bruno was the, the opposite the, it was down hooks which is really interesting if you break it down and analyze how that works and why that works lock that of heaven was that perfect example of music going to to pop music going towards that direction of down hooks you know and and uh for me that was honestly just a fresh perspective on on a, on a pop song so trying to get it to still be exciting and kind of the you know the highs and lows of i always say the mind fucking you know that goes on in the song to keep listeners engaged uh you know we tried a few things that were not really what we were used to doing and uh so it was a fun time because there was a lot of experimentation happening with both analog and digital and and even mastering too uh and how we you know how we that that album wasn't really mastered you know because bruno never liked mastering when it came back you know so we just leveled it out you know i knew that song number three was 
1.2 down, saw number four, we brought it up 0.2 or one and a half, and, and it was left unmastered. Right. And, and, uh, and then when you bring that, if you play that album, you can turn that album, I mean, you can go up, you can turn it up really loud, and it, and it won't hurt your ears, you know? And that was uh, that was the point. That was definitely on purpose, and um, so it was like the pop version of him without sounding pop, I guess. Right. I mean, you know, beautiful girls, kind of getting away from that, you know, and doing, I want to fuck you like a gorilla. <laughs> you know, that a, <laughs> that's a lyric. Uh, so um, yeah, he was graduating from being the the the. the the pop star that he was. Right, right, and really writing for himself as well. What's that? Writing for himself as opposed to possibly writing for other people. Exactly, exactly. And that was many conversations on, look, my first album was, they were, yeah, like you said, they were meant for other artists, not not necessarily for him. And uh, so, yeah, that was fun, man. That was a a lot of fun moments with uh, both Phil and, uh, and Bruno. I love the the just the little thing about people like oh I don't know this album's all over the place like have they <laughs> not heard like two of the most successful artists in the history of pop records are the Beatles and Bowie all those records are all over the fucking place man I mean even as an artist when they go to Revolver I mean you know can you imagine what that but would what just, that was like but what about just within Revolver you yeah. know Eleanor Rigby and Tomorrow Never Knows in with Taxman like. Yeah. Are you kidding? Three completely different albums almost. You know? like, and they're also the answer to the argument of like, how do you tie a record together? Like, well, you don't. You, <laughs> you, don't. you don't need to. And you know, some people say, yeah. well, the, the singer will tie it together. Well, they had four lead singers. Like, it's just, yeah. just make the record. Yeah. It's yeah. going to work. Record, And hopefully you have good artistry that comes with it. You know? Exactly. It doesn't work for everyone, but some some of these iconic artists make it make it work. Yeah. So let me ask you a little tiny question about the uh, Locked Out of Heaven mix. You're saying you, you automated the multiband between these three sections of the song. You'd never done yep. that before. I'm curious what brought you to the moment of thinking to even try that. Was it just like this tiny little blip? Oh, let me try doing that. Or was it like a sort of a big idea? No, you know, it was it was kind of like automating things within the mix, you know, like... But it wasn't working. It was kind of working, but it wasn't like. And then, and then at one point, I, I forget when that moment was. Where like, you know, I'm like, well, if we were to be mastering this, how would we do it? And and we were very conscious of the three sections, right? And I was like, how do you glue them, but at the same time have personality without you knowing it as a listener? Like maybe people when they go back and listen to it, they'll realize, oh shit, it is three different sort of songs. Well, and then just trying things on the desk in the box and not being successful with the feel of it, right? And and then uh, I was like, "Fuck it, let me just try automating," you know, because this section I wanted to hit hard, but it's too harsh or too pointy or not enough point or too bassy or whatever that was. And I kept doing it with the uh, the actual sounds themselves, and it just felt okay, but it wasn't like it didn't wasn't capturing that emotion so i popped a couple things on the stereo bus and i'm like oh shit this actually works but the plugin that i was doing it with you know i i had to punch in because it you know the automation was has the the delay (laughs) you know right so it was uh, it was challenging because i you know sometimes it would i would hear the bypass sometimes i wouldn't so it was imagine printing we had like even just the final mix was like 20, you know, not maybe not 20, but a dozen different takes so that it wouldn't click and then punching in and 10 times until it wouldn't click. And anyways, but I think creatively it was just searching for something that I tried to do in different ways that didn't really work. So it's almost like trying everything until it works. And, yeah. you know, and this just happened to work. It's interesting. I'm only asking because I just did a mix for somebody a few days ago where like it was all good but it just wasn't working and it wasn't working i couldn't figure out why and then all of a sudden i just sort of out of nowhere like i'm gonna take all the top end off this mix Mm. and it's like oh shit that's awesome but then the middle of the song's not good so i'm actually automating a low pass 
yeah. throughout the entire song. And I've mm-hmm. never done that before. I'm sure I'll never do it again. And I wish <laughs> I knew how I thought of it because I'm like, I'm going to get in a box on something. I want to know where I went mm-hmm. to define it. But it just sort of fully formed, finally went boink to that. And yeah. And that's it's, the beauty about why we keep doing what we're doing, because you find that moment of like, man, I thought, you know, just when you've been making, you know, making records for a long time, we both have, and to still have that sort of spark of thinking, you know, like there's no rules. I think that's really, really important to continue to do. There's, there, there are no rules. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, absolutely. All right. All right. So the John Mayer thing worked because you became quite eclectic. Not that you weren't already, but I just want to give a little list of some stuff you mixed in 2012, shall we? Or it came <laughs> out in 2012. Here's right. here's the incredibly partial list of what you mixed that came out that year. Lana Del Rey, Rolling Stones, Imagine Dragons, Colby Calais, Linkin Park, Taylor Swift, Fun, and DJ Khaled. Khaled. So, like, what the fuck, man? Yeah, man. <laughs> that's, that's one of each. Oh, man, that's a... Uh... That's a good list. Up is tight. <laughs> so let's talk about the stones. Let's talk about that yeah. because that's, you know. Yeah. No matter how eclectic you want to be, that that seems unexpected, even though it makes perfect sense. Hmm. Yeah, that was, you know, um, that was the 50th anniversary. And, uh, you know, I don't know if you guys know much about the stones, how Keith and Mick don't really get along in the studio. So uh, they wanted to... Uh, for their 50th anniversary, they wanted to release one song each. And uh, thankfully I got the call. One uh, from from Keith was uh, Jeff Basker. We, we had done Kanye and Alicia Keys and all that with. And then on the other side was uh, Don Was. And I had worked with Don as well. Uh, I think we had done maybe John Mayer at the time. I don't I forget, but anyways. Uh, it was amazing because there were two completely different vibes, the two songs. One was very uh, very uh, progressive and current, the, the, the uh, Mick one, because you got Jeff Basker and we had done, you know, like 808s and Heartbreak with Kanye and, and a bunch of other things. So it was very progressive. And, and the other one was straight up, you know, fucking rock and roll, you know. Uh, but we, the goal was to make it, you know, just be the stones of whatever the, that year was, 2010. Uh, I forget the year. But anyways, so I think that's probably why I got the call, <laughs> just to make it sound maybe different than what, say, some of the other guys would have done. So my approach with that was just like, again, going back to John Mayer, how, how my perception of me uh, hearing the stones today, like what what would I like to hear if the stones were doing the record today? Like, how would I like to hear John Mayer with, oh, oh, the roots, you know, with, with, uh, with the uh, uh, mix song is like, oh, what if Kanye was producing it with Jeff Basker? How would that that what would that be like? And being mindful of what makes Kanye, Kanye for eight or eights and heartbreak, you know, you take like the top whatever five, ten, thirty things that come to mind, and you kind of have those in the back of your head as you're working on it. So, uh, and then how would I like, you know, uh, Keith to sound like, you know, he's fucking 28 again and, and give it a certain sound, you know, but still not changing, not like reinventing it, but just enough things that, oh, those are the stones. But then when you really, really analyze it, you're like, oh, well, wow, there's a lot of this or a lot of that or not enough of this. Um, so the goal is to make it just effortless, maybe sound effortless but giving it i always say the tabasco you know (laughs) so that it becomes different enough to them to them so that they feel like they're progressing you know they're evolving right fun man and i mean mick has always done that you know he's always he made a disco record yeah you know yeah maybe questionable but (laughs) (laughs) but as an artist you gotta try it that's why listen Right, like Madonna's always been amazing at that because she keeps reinventing herself and keeps her, you know, ex- keeps everything exciting. It, sometimes it may not work, but you know, you kind of have yeah, got to have that mentality. Yeah, but not not just copying. You yeah. know, it's they're excited Copy. about what they're doing. I mean, you know, and Bowie made a drum and bass record, 
And it yeah. wasn't so great, but he yeah. made one. Listen, Kanye is a perfect example of someone that is constantly evolving. It doesn't always work, but you know that's what makes him Kanye. You know, uh, so there's a lot of artists that are willing to sound wrong. You know, they were willing to take that risk. Right. Uh, and that's a you know, as an artist, that's a big risk. You know, that's why a lot of artists can't do it. Yeah. Um, all right. I want to, because I definitely, we got to get to all the other stuff you're doing and we're already almost an hour in. Um, mm-hmm. But there's still, man, there's so much stuff. But let's let's just pick a couple like little weirder ones, like Leon Bridges. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So Leon Bridges, for people who don't know him up until that point, like he did a record live to eight track, no overdubs, yep. everything's bleeding like fucking crazy like Uh, super old school that dude is a 90 year old in a 20 year old's body yep so how did that come about because it again it makes perfect sense to me but it's not an obvious choice you know for that one is uh i gotta thank ricky reed uh wallpaper uh he produced the album and thought it was you know i would you know be a good fit and uh now Ricky is an amazing producer. If you don't know who he is, he uh, he's a, you know he's a sonic producer. So the stuff that I got by the time it got to me, it was just like feeling so good. And for me, it was that type of project was like what to do not to fuck it up, you know. Right. <laughs> so uh, yeah, just running it, making you know the low end, make sure that again going back to what you said, being that analog guy, but yet. But yet, you know, contemporary, so that it would, you know, coexist with some of the other contemporary artists out there. So it was that that album was kind of getting him away from that, and but still keeping that, you know, keeping some of it, some of the integrity of being an analog, like the ninety-year-old dude trapped in, you know. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, it was just one of those things again, man. Going back to. Uh, what's your perception of someone like that and today being and you take that information in your head and you kind of store it in that hard drive of yours and you said whenever is necessary because even within the album each song could have a completely different feel and within the album each song needs to be treated almost different so uh but your kind of sound has to be it's got to be a cohesive album as well right a collection of songs um, and you know, one thing that I've never done, and I know some, you know, peers do this, uh, where they, they'll listen to other things or they'll, they'll listen, they're doing an album. They'll put a couple of the songs within the album in there so you can reference those. So that you kind of are in the same universe. And I've never done that. You know, I've always gone with just a, just a natural instinct. Um, and again, some roughs are really good and you don't want to fuck them up. And others, you kind of roll, roll, roll up the sleeves and do stuff that you would do to, to, to make it what it's supposed to be, right? Uh, and then you get lucky and hopefully all the songs kind of, you know, work together, you know? And I think that's kind of the, you know, I never wanted to sound the same either, like an album to sound right. the same. Like we're talking maybe one has a little more top end or more booty or more mids or not enough maybe that's what makes albums kind of you know like just interesting when yeah. you listen to it from beginning to end it's like it doesn't sound like one continuous song you know and that's probably why i don't do that um just to give it enough i trust myself that i hear things a certain way that i trust myself that hopefully it'll be in the same you know uh, well, I think okay. we we do. I mean, because we always mix stuff the way we hear it, no matter what. I mean, obviously, we're always following the artist's vision, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But it's always through the, the filter of our lens. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, like, for me, references just confuse the hell out of me. Because you go in yeah. thinking, like, okay, let me check out the bass. But, like, the difference between the bass level and the vocal level is so crazy compared to what you're working on. that all you can think is, oh, wow, the vocal's way too quiet. Like, yep. And you didn't even listen to the bass. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah, I'm not a reference person either. I can't do yeah, it. And then you become an insecure mixer, and, and you know, and we can spot those fucking a mile away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Two thumbs, this guy. <laughs> this guy. I think we all are. Come on. Yeah, to a point. I, yeah. 
you know, anyway, we don't we don't have to go down that rabbit hole of my dark soul. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's if you can keep your perspective, then you don't really uh, all that can happen from a reference is it'll make you think you should do something instead of what you want to do. Maybe and, and you again going back to left brain, right brain, you'll you'll do it because you're hearing it a, a certain way as opposed to feeling it a certain way, which is what you should yeah. be doing. Whereas I think that for me anyway, referencing the rough a lot is actually really, really helpful. But I'm not listening for it's like how does the snare feel? How does it transition into the right. chorus feel? Like I feel like this should be a goosebumps moment. Was it or have neither of us gotten there yet? And it's always like really great when you go back to the rough and like, okay, cool, they didn't do it either. But there's yep. nothing more depressing than like, yep, this sounds a million times better and feels yeah. terrible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Agreed. It does happen. It does happen. So look, I'm going to skip over another 450,000 <laughs> records <laughs> that I want to talk about. But I feel like we have to talk about the other side of you, which is the side of you that now owns studios and restaurants and like mm -hmm. you're doing it. So I talked to Dave Way about when he bought Andorra, which, you know, was another part of Larrabee. Yeah, so yeah. everybody who's cool seems to buy parts of Larrabee. That's the thing, <laughs> man. That's so right, let dude. me let me let's talk about that, because you talked at length about how you wanted a room. And you kind of tricked your way into the room you wanted and all of that. And, but like that was the goal to have your own room somewhere. But basically you would have been parked there. Someone else is paying for the room yeah. by booking it and that. But that's a long way off from owning the facility. So yeah, you know, uh, Kevin Mills came up to me one day uh, a while back and said the, uh, one of the owners, the previous owner, and he's uh, which he's still involved. But uh, he, he's like, man, he, Napster's about to go down. This the ship is sinking. I'm out. Yeah, I think I'm thinking of selling the studio. I'm like, and he goes, "Would you want to buy it?" And this is just you know, and I'm like, I'm like, no. I'm like, that's that sounds like the worst thing. You know, like sounds like the worst <laughs> idea ever. No, I don't want to buy the studio. Are you kidding? I'm not a studio owner. I'm a studio rat. So uh, he goes, well, you know, if um, if I sell it. This is how I wasn't even thinking. He goes, you know, if I sell it, you know, somebody, whoever buys it can kick you out. You know that, right? Because, you know, you don't, I don't have a lease agreement or any of that. I'm like, oh, shit, you're right. It's not like being in an apartment and you sell the building and you stay. No, you're right. People get, I'm like, oh, I got to, you know, again, I spent so much time and effort getting into Larrabee. Now, if he sells it to anybody, there's a possibility of them kicking me out of my own room. I'm like, that, that can't happen. So I'm like, <laughs> I go to my business manager. I'm like, hey, man, I'm thinking of doing this because the last thing I want, I mean, I moved closer to the studio. My whole life is around the studio here. And he's like, Manny, that's the worst idea. You can don't do it. You know, <laughs> the ship is sinking. Boom, like, get out now. I'm like, and I went and I did exact, everyone tried to talk me out of it. And I did exactly the, 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 the I did the opposite. I ended and what, up, what year are we in approximately here oh gosh um you know ownership took a few years because you know listen I, I didn't have the capital at the time and it just you know kevin bless his heart man i love that guy to death and he made it sim easier for me to over time acquire equity as we you know as i quote performed mm -hmm. And that was the best thing that happened because it wasn't like, it didn't go from like, here's a sale, like like you're buying a house, like from, you know, you close escrow and it's you, it becomes yours. So it took years for, for, for that to happen, but he made it easy for me to kind of transition. Uh, I had been a loyal client for years, you know, I've been in my room in Studio 2 at Larrabee, I'd been there. I mean, I'd been, yeah, it's been, oh gosh, maybe 22, 23 years. So I'd been a, a loyal client and he, and he thought, you know, when Napster hit, I, I remember being the only guy here for months at a time. So business studio business, by the way, is not a good business. I, I don't recommend going into the studio <laughs> business because you'll park your money in fucking crypto or the market and you'll <laughs> will do way better than the studio, but it's a labor of love, you know? So for me, it's, it, it's, it was a labor of love. I wanted to 
have, you know, my uh, my place. I didn't want to have someone kick me out of my place. You know, that's that to me was. So I didn't do it based. I didn't look at the numbers and say, oh, this is this could be a good business. I just the fear. It was just based out of fear of losing a room that I'm that I've done. You know, all those records you mentioned. You know, that's like to me that's my sonic temple. I can I can risk 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 that. Um, so, you know, lo long story short, um, you know, I started gaining that equity and, uh, I had been very involved in the operation just cause this is my home. Uh, so I had been like, you know, my goal was to always have a art studio. You know, I'd never wanted a plaque on the wall and I told Kevin like, to take plaques down and do this and do that. So I kind of was doing more of the operation already and, uh, little by little just became, what it was and when I took over we had three rooms and now we're up to six or seven yeah including a mastering room a production room and I know we'll talk about the Schnee room and stuff like that but uh it wasn't the initial idea wasn't to be you know to make it a to make a business out of it it was just based out of fear <laughs> right. well because we we talked about this years ago when I was looking for what to do with my gear and things mm -hmm. and just talking about the fact like for me i've always had this like diy it's in my garage thing and like somehow i make that work and you're like man you can't do that you need a place where people can show up and be like fuck yeah, yeah. and it's really important for your clients to be able to do that and so it, yeah. some people might think like oh god he's scared cause of the you know losing the room and obviously you're comfortable in the room but you could mix in the back of a bus and you'd be fine <laughs> i like, should try that you, you should try that actually not not even an airstream just like some city bus you could do it you could do it on headphones with a four track and it would still be better oh, than yeah. what most people were doing but but the point was it wasn't just the console or the gear it was everything about it yeah you know i i always fuck man it's um you know, I, I never wanted someone at my home. That's I'm, I'm such a private person. I, I, I could listen financially. I would be way better off. Maybe that house in the Bahamas I would be <laughs> way sooner than. <laughs> so financially, I, I'd probably be way better off doing it. You know, in my home, really, and or somewhere. You know, uh, but that to me is like to me it was never the choice or the uh, an option for for me. It's always been about. I know this may sound weird or silly, but uh, to me, I was a purist for the art form and not necessarily f for financial, you know, which, look, it's a very naive way of looking at things. But for me, it kind of worked, you know, it kind of worked. I'd never thought, oh, man, I'm going to pay X amount where I could be getting it for me instead of giving it to Larrabee. And, um, and my mom always, she's always said, mijo. <laughs> Always, anything you do, don't do it for the. Of course, we need the money. Uh, we all need it, but th that can't be the reason why you do certain things. And I always had that in my mind. Like, look, if you work hard at something and you put your heart and soul into it, hopefully, good things will happen, and they will happen with time. And you just gotta have patience, right? But you gotta work hard, and you gotta be smart about it. Uh, you can't just like not work hard and expect things, which is a lot of us tend to do that too but um for me it wasn't even about a business as much as like look i want to create the best possible scenario for me to be able to perform uh for my clients because look i still take it seriously i think it's the biggest compliment that someone is willing to pay you money to work on their baby i mean that still to me blows my mind to this day you know and i'm very humble by that and i want to continue that and i want to continue to give the best possible service. So if I was, you know, for me is like, if you want to come and, and we have an espresso machine and mm -hmm. you can have that experience, then great. You know, that's part of, that's part of it. It's like an experience. And I want to be able to come in and have the tools that I need, that I think I need to hopefully perform at its best, you know? And I, and I think I owe it to the people that are paying me to do that, you know? Yeah. And so that was the idea, you know, that was the simple idea of like, Okay, let's let's do it. Let's see. Again, I didn't want to acquire a studio. That's you know that wasn't on the agenda, but uh, but it's worked out. You know, knock on wood, it's worked yeah, out. Yeah. So. Well, look, I I think that it's it's also it's the bigger picture view of what Kevin was seeing. He's seen the music business is going to implode. 
like they've been printing money for years and years and years, that's going to stop. He's absolutely right about that. But if you think it all the way through, what you realize is supply will meet demand in the recording studio game. And there will still be a much smaller number, but there will still be high-end studios because there will always be high-end studios. And you're perfectly positioned. Yeah. You know, before, uh, these studios were owned by individuals that were not in the business. They were just businessmen, right? Because... Remember back in record plan back in the mid nineties was like thirty five hundred a day for a room for a twelve hour lockout. The moment that thirteenth hour it was like five hundred an ex- extra an hour for yeah, overtime. Yep, yeah, and you're paying for your waters after the first day and yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean I saw the bill, I'm like, You're charging me charging me for water, okay? But hey, listen, you know, labels didn't pot, didn't mind paying that. And it yeah. was a legitimate business for studios. And then, of course, Napster, you know, and, and that changed the whole business model. So, so now I think studios are owned by users, you know, uh, because if there was a businessman trying to buy this, you know, you don't make the, the, the profit margins aren't there for you to, you know, it's again, it's high, you know, low pr- profit margins and a lot of room for error. There's, it's, it's not a business model that a smart businessman would go into you know it's it just wouldn't <laughs> the passion project it is a passion because everything that comes in goes right back out to the business you know? yeah but it's it's working out yeah no no, no <laughs> listen it's working out great you know it's great because you know now i have my i have my two rooms and i and i can you know i can if i need a third room to throw this here because i'm doing atmos or this or, i mean it gives me the flexibility to to really, really, again, not cut corners and hopefully perform, you know, the, the way I, I think I could or should, you know? Right. And I also love that you are, you're employing a bunch of people, you know, yeah. there are people yeah. coming up and learning. And I mean, I, I'm doing this instead, but like, I haven't had an assistant now in 10 years and, right. and right. it's brilliant. You know, you, you're one of the few people left who's got that traditional studio thing going on where people can learn how to make records dinosaur yeah <laughs> <laughs> but it's you're an important dinosaur that's the thing you're not some plant piece of shit hiding yeah. out in the bushes you know i don't think you're velociraptor either I, i'll think of a, the proper dinosaur it's like what's your what's your dinosaur name um all right <laughs> yeah just can't reach the faders <laughs> um, yeah you know I do it again, going back to the passion, man. I just do it based on passion and, and hopefully it, good things come out of it. Um, you know, with, with Larry, it's, you know, it's friends and family here. You know, uh, we are very picky on who works here. I'd rather this place be completely em- empty, you know, uh, than, than hire, than, than have a book sessions with people that don't respect, uh, what I call as Sonic temples, you know, so. Right. We don't mind saying no to people, you know, and thankfully uh, we're in a position to be able to do that. You know? uh, well, Sonic Temples is the perfect transition to talking about the little room next door that yeah, you yeah, picked yeah. up. <laughs> which, yeah, the little room, which I think is probably one of the best, if, you know, rooms in the world that yep. people never heard of. Uh, Schnee, uh, Bill, you know, what an amazing guy. Uh, built in a, an incredible, incredible room, uh, and I took over that room a few years ago. With after many conversations with Bill, we became really good friends, and uh, and he, uh, you know, uh, it was one of the best decisions I made because it's man, I don't know what would happen if somebody else would have bought it. You know, they probably either turned it into a freaking apartment building or who knows, who knows, a garage. <laughs> yeah. But uh, man, the history in that room. Oh my. Gosh, I can't, you know, begin to even name drop all the uh, all the records that he did in there, classic records. And uh, and you know, Bill just said, "Hey, man, I think it's gonna be in good hands," you know. And I and I have I take that responsibility very seriously, you know. I'm like, no, it is gonna be in the best hands because I'm gonna take care of it. I'm gonna hopefully keep that legacy alive. And uh, and now that for the first time ever, and since 1981, the place is a you know, it's available to book, for, and you know, and that's, I mean, that to me is amazing because it's, it, I, I imagine Abbey Road being a private studio for 30 plus years, you know, 
and that's exactly what this is. If this was a, if it was a commercial room, I think it would be named, you know, with the with the likes of Abbey Road and East West and Capitol, and it's that good. And I just I, tracked drums the other day, and, and I yeah, and, and I haven't done it in a while, and I'm like. I just couldn't believe it, man. I put, I had a, the, the whole mic kit, and I used like two mics, and it sounded, fucking, I mean, better than anything, <laughs> any place I've cut drums. In. There are two studios where I remember getting stuff to work on, not even mixing, it's probably just doing overdubs or something, and where you put up any microphone, and it just sounds better yeah. than anything you've ever recorded, and it yeah. was Sound City A and Schnee's Room, and that was it, wow. and not, not Abbey Road, not yeah. you know yeah. those are yeah. fantastic rooms that do it but not like the 57 that ended up pointed at the floor because the stand was broken is still like the best sounding <laughs> drum mic yeah. you've ever heard yeah man it's such a special room uh it's it's again like i'm so happy you say that because it's i i feel like i say it enough as you know, i'm not a i'm not a seller i'm a buyer i'm not, I'm not a hype guy uh but let me tell you the, you know this room is Again, one of the most amazing sounding rooms I've ever worked in. Yeah, uh, and it's a you know it's a popular room. People love it. They camp themselves out there for months at a time, and it's super private. And it's you know we got amazing microphones. Um, you know we switched when I took over. We switched the console just to make it more appealing to you know the current you know. Uh, so we yeah so we changed all the outboard console and all that. Um, and, um, you know, it's thankfully it's doing well um, and it's there. I mean, the, the thing that gives me, you know, that I can sleep at night is knowing that no one's going to come by it and kick us out. You know? <laughs> Which is the story of your life. Yeah. yeah, man. yeah. I feel like someone's going to walk in and be like, all right, man, time to go. I'm like, oh, all right, got, you know. So, wait, I should know this. Was it a commercial studio before 81? It wasn't, right? I mean, Bill built it. Right, he built it from the ground. Yeah. Up. yeah, okay, that's what I thought. So it it had never been commercial. I mean, obviously, all the records he made were done there, and he would let yeah. a few people come in and and book it. But I I know uh, I knew the landlord. I know the landlord, but uh, she she actually grew up in that. It was a it, back in whatever the I don't know fifties. It was a you know it was like someone lived there, and then uh, and then it became a garage, <clears throat> like an auto uh, had a auto shop mechanics uh auto mechanic shop and then bill i think took over and just built it from the ground up right well let's creep a little bit further north on lancashire <laughs> <laughs> so you got a restaurant i got a restaurant thing. i don't recommend getting into the studio business nor the <laughs> restaurant business two businesses <laughs> Uh yeah, first, you know, that um about 5 years ago, it was one of those, you know, whether it's midlife crisis or what, you know, or mixing the same record 300 times and it was a very uninspiring time for me. I didn't think I was going to quit because I can't quit. Um uh, but I thought I was not going through a good time creatively. Just that I feel like uh was, you know, uh, there was a restaurant there before, um, and we would, you know, take a year break and go have a glass of wine all the time. And and uh, one of the, the the owner at the time came up to me and asked me if I would help do a, uh, since I'm in music, I can help uh, do a club, <laughs> I'm like a club, like a doom, 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 that type of club. She's like, yeah, you know. I'm like, no, of course not. I, you know, I hate <laughs> Even in my prime, I didn't go to clubs. No. I, and then I said, look, but if you do live music then maybe i can help and that's really what you know kind of triggered that i always you know i thought you know what uh, talking to my mom mijo you know <laughs> like they always say follow your passion right that's that's what everyone says when you, you're in a rut and i thought about it i'm like shit what are, what are my passions i've been in the studio since i was 15 you know and it's uh definitely music is still my passion i'm still a music fan uh and, I, and food, you know, travel the world, going to restaurants, right? Like I'm a foodie, and I've been collecting wine since I was like 18, you know. So, so I thought, all right, the trifecta. So, <laughs> so eventually, long, very long story short, because I could literally write a book about this place, which you journey. should do, actually. The journey alone, yeah, just up, just about verse, by the way. <laughs> yeah, no, no, exactly. 
So we uh, uh, fast forward. I ended up thinking, you know what? The studio's right next door. I want to, you know, I feel like I've mixed enough records. Now I want a new challenge. And the new challenge is I want to, you know, I want to create a, an environment where musicians can come and be and be captured in a, in a way like as if we were at Schnee Studio with the best microphones, the best acoustically treated room and the best instruments and all of that. So um, that was the dream of uh, building a studio big enough to and putting a restaurant in it. And that's uh, and that's really what it is. It's a it's a studio with a restaurant in it and uh, and the performance space where we have an SSL at the place of 300 where we capture content and that's what we're doing. So we, we, we have live music every night from Tuesdays to Saturdays and and with no PR, we reopened four months ago, almost five. Uh, well, first of all, going back, uh, we opened three months into uh, and then the pan- pandemic hit. Yeah. So we shut down immediately. And I gotta say the silver lining is, uh, in COVID for us in verse was the best thing that happened, you know, because it gave me time to really, really understand the business maybe understand what you know the identity of what verse you know i thought verse was going to be like and how you pivot my favorite word in the restaurant business is pivot <laughs> um and how you know and just finding the right menu the right the, the right culture the right staff and before pre-pandemic i don't know if we would have made it to be honest with you with with some of the uh, culture that we had uh, and that those 16 months, man, it gave me the opportunity to really, you know, educate myself. And then we uh, reopened four months ago, like I said, and uh, with new culture, new menu, new chef, new management, the whole nine. And uh, you know, it's all been word of mouth, uh, no PR, no marketing. It's all internal. And we're man, knock on wood, we're doing so good right now. Um, and uh, f- we're actually having uh, a private performance, not private, but, you know, uh, semi-private performance this Friday, Saturday, and we're cutting a live album, you know, so that was, the- so finally the dream is coming true of, you know, it's going to be Terrace Martin presents, and uh, th- for those of you who don't know Terrace Martin, he, the pimp of butterfly, he has, you know, very responsible for Kendrick's, you know, success, he's producing Herbie Hancock's new album, so, you know, quality, quality. And he's got some good friends, you know, that are going to come up and uh, we're going to record an album. We're going to put it on vinyl. We're going to release it as an NFT collection, you know. So I'm trying to, like, look ahead and and uh, and do things like unique things that really help the artist. You know, most uh, I, I feel like I created verse for for artists and for us to be able to capture performances, live performances. Look, we have so I, I feel like we have the best of both worlds. We can obviously capture it in the studio and now capture it live and the sound system in there is incredible incredible we went with Meyer Meyer the best fucking company out there <laughs> Helen Meyer and John are they saw the vision with me and and they took a big gamble on me and and I got to say for that I'm eternally thankful to them and uh we created a special place man uh and and people are feeling it people are liking it uh, we become we're becoming a destination place where the food is actually really really good, uh, and the music is amazing. We're having a ton of musicians, and and the drinks uh, are there. So the tri- again the trifecta. So we're, we're every weekend we do something really cool and special, and you know and that's man it's given me a new life and even in the studio mixing because that business is so so tough as you can imagine. And everyone's like, oh, the restaurant business is the toughest. They're right. <laughs> Everyone's right. Uh, very low margins, uh, high volume, low margins, a lot of room for error. So uh, and a lot of personalities. Uh, but it's giving me. So then when I come in and I mix records, uh, it's like oh, it's like fuck, man. I feel like <laughs> taking <re-drinking>. a break. <laughs> oh yes, I'm taking a break. And it's given me a whole new. Uh, I don't know. Uh, fresh perspective on, on mixing records you know almost like being in love with the art form again not that i ever fell out of love but just confused you know that you just gotta do the cycle the metamorphosis and the, how you, how you evolve as a person and in your career so i feel like verse has 
given me this um, insane amount of like appreciation that I had before, but I have it on a deeper level now for what we do, you know, and uh, I don't know if it's made me a better mixer because I don't, <laughs> it's maybe, <laughs> what I mean. but it's definitely given me this new life in the studio and, and uh, where before I was kind of, you know, like I said, I talked about being comfortable and being, not that I ever was comfortable, but subconsciously I was thinking of other things, you know, like uh, whether what's the next phase in your life, you know, what's right. the next chapter, right? And I think we all think like that uh, naturally. So for me, it was like it's giving me this new energy on the mixing end, you know. And I'm having fun, man. I'm having a lot of fun, a lot of work, a lot of challenges, but man, I, 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 I one thing I learned about myself is. I, you know, I just like challenges, you know, and I embrace the, uh, I embrace it, the, the hard work that comes with it and the, uh, and how you have to adapt to different scenarios and how you hopefully become a better leader and, you know, and, and then being conscious of all those things, you know, and, uh, and it's an exciting new chapter for me, you know, and whatever happens, happens. That to me is not the, out, the outcome, you know, but that's the silly saying is not the destination is the journey. And I'm right. really, really enjoying the journey. And I'm meeting so many new people that I would have never have had access to uh, personality wise uh, if I was just a studio rat. So, I'm, you know, we're, we're in, the, in the same room for, you know, 10, 12, 15 hours a day. Yeah. Giving me just a new, you know, just perspective on everything. So for that, um, for that reason, Again, whatever happens in the future, it's already a success in my mind. That's awesome. So I got two questions about it. One is, well, do you want to talk a little more specifically about the sound system? Because it's not just like a PA. Like, it's <laughs> serious. <laughs> There's a, It's an immersive, uh, well, first it's a convolution physical room. So we can actually make a sound inside you can make it sound like a tight jazz club and we can go from the Walt Disney Hall to the Lincoln Center to the Taj Mahal and it will I mean when you hear it it really fucks you up because it's it's incredible what they've been able to do and it's a noise cancellation system as well so even on Saturday we had gosh we almost had 200 people in there in and out and at one point we had about 110 and I went and checked it out and and you can still, you know, imagine each table has a uh, spotlight on them, right? And the person, the table next to you, you can't hear their conversation. Uh, no matter how much you try. That's amazing. Uh, uh, you just hear energy and you hear f few words, but you cannot make it out. But then the same person, the same distance, person that's across from you, you can hear everything. And uh, so it's uh, it's almost like you're in this bubble. And it's uh, that zone, is the, the phase is flipped. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, kind of cancels out, but they have, we have 60 plus my, uh, speakers all over the place. We have eight subwoofers. We have, uh, uh, 19 microphones and the microphones are picking up the energy. So it's the Charlie Brown effect where you hear energy, but you can't pick, you know, you can't make out what they're saying because you're hearing the bar maybe as loud as that table next to you. Right. So speakers, right. And then, and then we, you know, they face canceled all the silverware, so you don't hear any, you know, clink, 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 you know, and and that's really important because for me it was capturing good content. So, so the the artist that's playing, they don't hear that annoying laugh or conversation right in front of them, and they don't hear people eating in front of them either. You know? Right. So that as an artist, you know, we're changing the perception of what a quote supper club is. You know, back in the '40s, '50s, you, you know. When we would go out, not we, but people went out, they, uh, you know, they got dressed up and they went and they went to eat and then they had their martini, their steak, and they always had a live performance, right? That was, that was part of going out. Somehow in the 60s, I don't know when that happened, where that stopped, that kind of, you know, and so to me it was like, what would that be in 2021, 2022? Like, you know, how can we... Well, we're not going to have a steak. We're going to have hopefully some, you know, we call it Angelino cuisine. We're not going to have a martini. Maybe you have a cocktail and we have music that's not jazz, but it's maybe it's a pop band or maybe it is a jazz band or maybe whatever, whatever it is, it's just quality musicianship. And I got to tell you, man, what we discovered is like people are not used to that, but they love it. 
they love love live music while they're eating while they pay paying attention they're having a conversation so so it's not like you're there to see a musical performance you're not there just for that you're not there just to eat you're not there just to drink but it's part of the soup the, the whole experience and we're discovering that that is something that is needed you know that uh, in the entertainment capital of the world which is LA nothing exists quite like that and it's a shame and now hopefully we can you know there'll be copycats because I, I feel like this you know we're employing a ton of musicians we're employing a lot of people that are really 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 into music and, and the trifecta and and uh, and guests are coming from all over I mean we've had guests coming from Texas because they heard about us coming from Vega and then when wow. they're, we're, we're in LA we're gonna go to verse and so it's finally happening and in, in, uh, from the restaurant side of things and for me capturing content like what we're about to do this Friday it's you know we're gonna release probably a hundred vinyls we'll destroy the, the you know the master and then it'll be sort of like that nft and then we'll also release it with some some uh, digital content so that it becomes so that hopefully the musicians can have a new platform you know right. to, to be able to uh, you know monetize their art form so again this is all for the artist man and hopefully I, I always say it's a uh, it's taking the uh, being a fly in the wall in the recording studio to a new level, you know, uh, and hopefully that happens, you know, uh, this Friday. And we've done it twice already uh, with albums, live albums. You know, hopefully these flies on the wall can have a good time and see what a recording is like, you know. And, and I love can, I love like, that you're, you're catering to the musician, but also to the diner, because I can't tell yeah. you how many meals Debbie and I have had where we don't say a fucking word because the table next to us is so loud that we just sit, we eat, we get out to the parking lot, laugh, get in the car and go home. Like yeah, yep. it's yeah, yeah. It's a problem. It's annoying. it's annoying and there's studies on the psychology of that too, you know. It's uh and how sound, how you adapt to it and how men, especially as we get older, we listen, we hear different frequencies of your hair follicles and how what that frequency is and how annoying that can be uh, not not adverse man it's pretty it's an incredible incredible sound system. and again not taking any credit but giving Meyer all the credit for helping me you know build this with this vision that that I, you know that I had and they were able to you know help out and uh, it was beyond my expectations and you know and uh, and for that reason, I think people are connecting, you know, and then that's the one thing that they all say is like, we can actually, there's this five piece band and we're 10 feet away and we can still almost whisper to each other and have a full on conversation. Uh, and the food is amazing. Uh, so it's, And you're so, not making the musicians feel like shit by talking exactly. while they're playing. Yep, yep. Because they don't hear anything. You know, they hear the energy again. Uh, so it's, you know, hopefully it's a win, win, win. It's something that's never been done before quite like this, you know? So I hope that, uh, you know, people keep embracing it and, uh, hopefully we get the support to be able to keep hiring musicians and keep doing really unique content and, and, uh, just keep pushing the envelope, you know, and be, hopefully be forward with it, you know, using technology. I always say I, I run it like a tech company. Uh, because we have digital platforms on how to run the restaurant and how to, you know, uh, just a whole list of things using d digital platforms to help us be a better business uh, and be a, hopefully a successful business. You know? That's amazing. And I love the fact that you've got musicians hired five nights a week playing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. I mean, and that just in and of itself, booking that many artists is that's amazing. And yeah. has it turned into a venue where touring musicians will play it yet, or is it mostly local? I think it's all local, but look, we're only four or five months in. I, I mean, I, I think I hopefully in the next couple of years, it, it hopefully it becomes a, a name everyone recognizes in the industry and and they trust and uh, i do believe that hey if the stones are playing so far you know maybe they'll come and do a little you know little, little secret show yeah. or this type of thing you know that's i hope that happens because it's it's too good for them not to do it and uh and i think as labels and artists start discovering the quality of it uh, again, I'm a buyer, not a seller. You know, we have done zero PR, zero marketing. 
Uh, maybe maybe in the next year we'll start ramping that up so that more established musicians and artists can hear about it. Um, and maybe that'll happen. But to me, again, even if we were to stay here employing local musicians, touring music, I mean, they're all yeah. pretty bad asses, you know. I'm satisfied with that. And then, you know, and I, but I do believe that it's going to lead to major artists. Uh, I mean, if we've had a ton of them. They do a lot of... Uh, we do uh, a lot of video shooting, a lot of content creation and stuff like that. So we've been doing that. Um, I mean, we've done a ton of photo shoots too. Like, um, so it's becoming, you know, and then the, the cool thing is on any, in any given night, I mean, it's a pretty stacked room. You know, you have a lot of music industry people, a lot of film because, because of the neighborhood, you know, and they're all embracing it. You know, a lot of executives, a lot of, TV, TV, film, and a lot of music cats. So, that's awesome, given, man. Go in there and see someone that you may recognize, you know. Um, and it, it feels like it can also fill a hole that I mean, it's been gone for years. There's been this hole that used to be like in New York could be the Village Vanguard and the Blue Note and right. though yeah. clubs where that mm-hmm. level of musicianship, but in genres that wouldn't necessarily book gigantic venues can Mm -hmm. be touring and have places to play that are sympathetic to the music and not just some shitty place because of the size. Exactly. Yeah. Fingers crossed, man. Awesome. (laughs) Well, I know next time I'm coming to LA, I will book a table months in advance so I can get one. (laughs) I know somebody, I know somebody. Oh, good. (laughs) Nice. I'll eat in the kitchen. That's fine. <laughs> we well, have a chef's table in the kitchen, so you know, it's <laughs> my favorite table. So. I'll bet. I'll bet. Man, it just sounds amazing. I love, I mean, obviously, I'm a huge fan of the mixes, but just the way the way you think about it and the way you do it and what you're trying to do, it's, uh, yeah, it's inspiring. It's great. Really, really great. You know, it's 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 crazy because, again, we get pigeonholed, right? Uh, I mean, if I had a dime for everyone to try to talk me out of everything I've ever done, then I wouldn't be here talking about it. You know, I uh, I believe that, you know, we have a, I don't know if it's, I don't want to sound too cheesy and it's a sense of re, uh, responsibility that we have, but in a weird way, maybe being from a different country, being against all odds, uh, I always uh, have this thing in my head that, Look, man, I hopefully I'm doing this hopefully for that 12 year old kid right now that will have someone he can at least relate to, you know, and I yeah. think that I think that's the least we can do. Uh, we've been given this amazing platform and amazing uh, opportunity. I think uh, it's time to hopefully, hopefully, hopefully inspire someone that that doesn't think they have the uh, the uh, you know they don't have a chance and they can see someone like myself like that they can relate to uh again being from a different country and and i mean i'm i'm the living proof of the american dream you know like if you work hard and if you put your you know everything you have into it the sky's the limit so hopefully you know listen hopefully this will be inspiring to 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 a lot of those kids you know the 12 year the 12 year old me you know like yeah and uh, when when I was you know or maybe 15 when I was trying to get in the industry then nobody looked like me in the industry you know so it was like I didn't really have someone that uh to look up to and I think that that's really important we all you know if we can have some that somebody that say, oh if, if that motherfucker did it I can do it too <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's also and I was thinking this earlier like we we're talking about reference mixes and things like whatever but it's always the idea while you're mixing is you need perspective you've got to constantly be a fresh listener you need to be the consumer and all that but it, it's like your childhood has given you that ability to com- keep resetting your view on what you're doing in life you're not getting stuck on the tiny minutia of trying to like ah, i want to mix that record but that guy's got like who cares like you know what you've got you know what you can do and you dream and do stuff and it's it's huge man a lot of people have ideas and not everybody actually follows through on any of them yeah and you're following through on pretty much all of them yeah <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I don't, uh, it's hard. It's not, you know, it's, you know, it, it's not easy, but I feel like, fuck, man, you, you got to take chances. You, you know, again, we mixers and engineers, they always, you know, we're the lowest hanging fruit and people don't think we can do things. And to me, I got that chip, you know, 
I'm like, when you tell me you can't do something, if I believe a hundred percent in it, I don't listen. You know, I actually yeah. use it as motivation. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, listen, I was in high school and I wanted to be, uh, I don't know if I told this story on a few episodes ago, <laughs> but, uh, you know, people try to talk me out of it. Like they wanted me to fix gear. They wanted me to, cause, cause I, you know, English is obviously my second language and, and they didn't think I could be in a, in a room with an artist. So hey, why don't you go in the back and fix gear? So to me, that I'll never forget that moment when that professor told me that and, uh, and told my other um, friend that I was with, giving him all the, uh, you know, look di different than me, but he was like, yeah, you can come to this school, you'll be a, this and you're an engineer and blah, blah, blah. And you, by the way, you can fix gear. <laughs> I'll never forget that. I, it's still like, like it happened yesterday. I can, if I knew how to draw, I can, you know, this draw the room and I remember every the, the, the wood the console the speakers everything him telling me that and I wow I, no you I didn't tell that, that one man Fuck. I did yeah, yeah I held that one and I still have it here not because he was an a-hole or anything but I use that as motivation because uh, this guy is literally like I'm trying to follow pursue a dream and he just like nope you're not gonna make it so therefore but if you want to be in the music industry there is a way you can do that and i i'll never forget that and i everything i did i was like just for that guy i'm like and many 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 others that said i couldn't do it it was like that chip and that like i'm gonna prove it to not to them because it doesn't matter i don't you know but to me to prove it to myself and maybe someday uh, i told you so even though i'll never do that but it's motivation man it's yeah. that motivation like oh really you don't think i can do that i wonder why your perception of me that's interesting and i think that happens on a daily basis with everyone and and it, and it continues to happen you know the, the restaurant was like everyone's like you know i was trying to raise capital for it and people laughed they're like you're a studio rat what do you know about restaurants you're correct you're 100 percent correct <laughs> but so one. what yeah but let's, let's 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 dream bigger and no nobody let me tell you nobody believed in that i mean nobody like you know again i'm a buyer not a seller that was the hardest thing to sell the idea of what it is and people like dude just stick to making records <laughs> i think that, i think there is a, there's a weird perception issue where like i mean first of all people think we don't work for a living and fair enough like there are plenty <laughs> of jobs that are a lot harder but it is it is hard work Can you talk about like the mental fatigue at the end of a day like we're working very very hard at what we do like that's yeah. whatever yeah. And some people will believe that, some people won't. But I think what gets overlooked a lot is, especially for mixers, we are 100% entrepreneurs all the time. Yeah. It, you yeah. can't be more self-employed unless you're an artist who's completely independent. Right. Like, that yeah. that's kind of it. Mm -hmm. And so we're constantly doing that. And I think that, I mean, we're, I think we're similar, where we love a project. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, oh, that isn't mixing and I can work through that from start to finish. Like it doesn't matter how hard it is. That's like, oh, that's doable. This next mix, I have absolutely no idea. I really yeah. hope that's gonna work out, but <laughs> restaurant, no problem. Like even if you know nothing about it and part of it is ignorance is bliss, but part of it is like you said, it's reinvigorated you in the studio just because you're doing something else that's hard that's outside of it. Mm -hmm. And again, going back to make sure that, you know, Make sure you don't do things uh, for the money, really. I mean, uh, you got to do a base out, out of passion. Passion is going to get you through those fucking walls, man. You know, like not, 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 not the money. Uh, the passion that you have for it, you're going to have 20 motherfuckers that are going to say no, and those are the walls that you got to get through. And only passion and the drive are going to get you there. Yeah. Nothing else will. Like you've seen dollar signs and maybe that car, house, whatever drives you. Uh, it ain't going to be enough to get you there because this, you know, I, I always say you got to get used to rejection more than than, than praise, right? And uh, some people see it as rejection. Other people see it as constructive criticism. And, uh, and I see it as constructive criticism when people said, fuck, dude, you're a studio rat. There's no way you can do this. And I'm like, you're probably right, but, you know, that's construct constructive criticism. So, therefore, I'm going to go and take some classes from Wharton on analytics so that I can run the restaurant like a, digit, like a tech company. And, and I'm going to, you know, do all the things that I need to do to hopefully put me in the best position to succeed. That's it. That's it. Whether it succeeds or not, 
what is success, right? To me, it's like not trying is not an option for me. You know, that 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 to me, then I then I would feel like a, <laughs> you yeah. know, like. But trying and 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 failing is admirable, and and I can see how scary it's shit, but but it's admirable, and you gotta you gotta just try and do it, and be smart about it, of course. You know, just yeah. be 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 strategic about it, and surround yourself with people that that believe in what you're trying to build. You know, and also yeah. if if you don't chase money, you're never gonna do something you're not passionate about. Yeah, you know. And there's no way to know. It's like the, like the conversation, I'm sure you've had it with bands throughout your entire career where like, well, do you think like it would be more successful if we did this with this song? Or like, who the fuck knows, man? <laughs> Diane Warren and Dr. Luke are like the only two people I can think of who actually know how to write a song that will be popular. <laughs> Nobody yeah. else on the planet knows how to do it, really. Nobody. So yeah. don't try. You do your best art all the time. And what you're doing with verse is as much art as what you're doing in the studio. Thank you, man. Thank you. Well, next time you're in L.A., you got to come. I absolutely will. I absolutely will. And I th I'm very aware of your time, and we're almost at two hours. So can we do a quick Q&A? Yeah, yeah. Let's get Mark so, in yeah. here and, and do some Q&A. So we skipped over a bunch of records, but, you know, <laughs> whatever. 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 Uh, yeah. So much fun, Manny. This has been great. So good. So good to, you know, revisit some of the records and, talk about what we love the most and talking shit <laughs> yeah we're gonna have to talk shit about mark soon he, he he's... oh there oh, fire away God, <laughs> you're such a good looking guy brother oh. <laughs> yep. God Killing damn. Me. every time i come in here fucking you guys with all your hair i'm sick look of at it. that uh... <laughs> you exfoliate <laughs> oh man you're the one with the fresh haircut Come oh, on. Shit. Oh. <laughs> yeah hey. that is that is nice thank you all right we're talking one. about hair that means it's q a time yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the worst transition of all time no, no. <laughs> um so if you guys are on youtube we are taking questions over on crowdcast you can get to there by going to puremix.net clicking on andrew talks to awesome people and you'll see the crowdcast link you can submit your question Everybody upvotes each other's questions and we start with the most voted question. So that today comes from the username is Callum. And he says, I'd like, I'd love if you could talk about your use of automation throughout the track and fader writing, not being from the analog world. It's daunting to know what to do. So, okay. There's two ways to look at it. One is on the console and the other one in the box. And uh, I do different sort of, I have different approaches to both. One is if if I'm on the console and I'm driving to a compressor inside the box, I, I need to do a post, you know, on the fader on the console. So I will do rides based on that. Now, if I want to drive into the compressor, I do a lot of pre rides so that it kind of glues certain things. Uh, so if I have something going into the compressor, I will ride that as opposed to a post. Uh, so you got to understand why you're doing the rides are you are you gluing are you trying to make things kind of sound like they're closer together or are you trying to just make sure it sounds louder or it comes out in the mix so first i would ask myself that question if it's you know trying to glue always do pre uh, and just make sure you watch that you know how much you're driving into it and if you're just trying to make something louder with that glue then do it post uh now you have you know you gotta worry worry about your stereo bus and how much processing you have going on in there as well. Uh, I find myself that if I drive into the compressor or limiter on the stereo bus, then you may have some problems. So now start maybe EQing certain things. So automation, I'm not sh I don't shy away from automating EQs. So it's not only level. I'm not shy from shit. We just had a whole conversation about doing uh, automating a, a multi band. Uh, on the stereo bus, so uh, I'm not shy about aut automation, but just make sure you ask yourself that question beforehand. Like, are you doing it to find glue or this, this and that, or just to bring that sound up in the, in the mix, you know? And you don't have to automate, but you don't have to not automate. Like, I mean, I use clip gain constantly, so yeah. there's a lot of stuff where I would have been riding faders long ago, yeah. but now I don't have to, because I'm constantly yeah. doing tweaky little automation things which if I did them at the beginning, because I'm in 
in the box, then those faders are no longer available to completely rebalance the track easily because once you put break points. So I tend to, to avoid fader automation until pretty late in the process, and sometimes I never get there. Yeah, you know, f funny you say that because my challenge, I, ch I challenge myself every mix not to automate, you know. Uh, and that means I get everything sort of sitting in the perfect spot. And then, like you said, Andrew, like at the end, you may now do very, very subtle rides, but challenge yourself to balance, EQ, compress, you know, and so that you don't have to. Because I. I've done. I made this mistake so many times where I start automating before I should, and then you start, ch you know, chasing your tail. So uh, my my approach is, I, I do that last, like you. Man. But at the same time, there's nothing wrong with turning up every drum fill a lot. Yeah. Right. Well, if yeah. that's what the song wants, that's what the song gets. Exactly. I hope that answered that. Wonderful. Okay. All right, our next question comes from Matt Langdale, and I'm going to edit it a little bit on the end. Um, <laughs> if you were forced to buy a new plugin tomorrow, which would it be and why would it be Omnichannel? <laughs> I'm just kidding. He didn't have the Omnichannel on the end of it. That's my bad joke. <laughs> Man, I'm going to give my, uh, my secret. So, no, uh, you know, the, the, we want the plugin with Waze was such a, you know, it was really interesting and i you know and it was really fulfilling and it was really challenging and you know um i haven't thought about doing any more plugins at the moment um just because i've been busy with other things but i feel like um i, I feel like room simulation is going to be a big thing in the future you know, like in the near future it's already here but you know we're talking about schnee like i would love someday to have a virtual schnee you know, room so that everybody in the world can have access to it. So if I if I were to do another plugin, I would do probably something like that. Yeah. And there's some really great reverbs out there too. I mean, I, I'm mixing a classical record right now, so I've had to really investigate and sort of build from scratch a lot of reverb chains. And t I've watched a lot of Alan Meyerson videos, I can tell you that. And it's uh, there is some really, really cool stuff out there. But yeah, I think the room thing, and especially thinking about capturing rooms circularly yeah. that's not but in an in a, an immersive way so that they can be used on the multiple sources coming from different directions as opposed to stereo source and then a big surround room i think that'll be really interesting too mm. now but was this person looking for a recommendation of a plugin that exists or yeah yeah they were saying if you were forced to buy a new plugin tomorrow oh, omni channel which would it obviously. be and why the manny uh, manny yeah, signature yeah. series and omni channel it's all you need really. yeah, there's a these many yeah. miracle uh, bundle yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> the only reason Might why i came on, on this show is to sell plugins so. yeah exactly yeah exactly <laughs> talk to, you know talk shit with Andrew and yeah and we'll, we'll pay him for that question in a minute <laughs> yeah exactly nice okay uh next one is from overlord of ebay uh man that makes me nervous that guy's probably pretty serious um, okay what are your basic decisions when mixing bass lines particularly for more bass forward mixes with stuff like bruno mars well you know it's to me the two of the hardest things to do is mix low end and vocals um because you, you know nowadays in pop music you have a kick you have probably multiple kicks you have 808s you have bass so there's a lot of information and not a lot of room down there um so i always think of a focal point you know if a bass line is doing a rhythmic part like if it's kind of grooving and it kind of makes me do this then i put my that, that to me will be the emphasis right other things i'm, I'm mixing a push a t record right now where it's all 808s and nothing else exists except 808s and vocals right so just make sure you know what the source is if the source if, if the bass, if you have a bass that's moving and it's playing melodic parts and rhythmic parts, uh, but the 808 is constant, you know which one's Batman and which one's Robin, you know. So you gotta, so if if Batman is like the bass line, then make sure that's your your focal point, and then color around the bass line. So so in other words, if it's somewhere, I don't know if they can see me, but if it's somewhere in your gut then how do you drop the 808 and get rid of what's fighting in that frequency spec 
spectrum. And now you got Batman and Robin, right? Now it could be the opposite. It could be a Pusha T track and the 808 is constant and the, and the bass line is, happens to be not the focal point. Then you can chop some of the bass off the bass and then you can actually do maybe more tone so that now, now you have Batman being the 808 and that it takes up a lot of the room and then you still have some type of that, some type of rhythm from the bass line. Uh, and, and the key here is how you connect those sounds, you know, I, that's the biggest key. Yeah, I think I, I never do this consciously, but there's always a distinction between the rhythmic low end and the melodic low end. And that could be the same instrument or it could be two different instruments, you know, kick and bass are your obvious mm -hmm. choices. But for the rhythmic low end, you've got to be aware of the entire groove. It goes with the hat and the snare and the rhythm of the vocal and rhythm guitars or whatever it is. And it, it, it's really easy to mess with the groove of the song by like making the bass instrument too important down there. And now the really sparse kick pattern is not so sparse anymore. It's just like little accents in this wall of low end. So don't, don't try and make the instruments sound great. Make them work, do their jobs, which is basically what Manny said. So I, I just do what Manny said. <laughs> and you know, one thing to keep in mind too is like, uh, we tend to solo things, you know, I, yeah. I honestly don't solo as much, you know, because the, 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 like you said, you brought up a really good point. It, it almost doesn't matter what the sound sounds like, and like when it's soloed. Does it work with, I say, the soup, the painting? Does it, you know, it, so, so make sure that you, solo things to see technically if it's, there's something a wrong with it or there's something like maybe there's a buzz or a low pitch that it's not that you got to take out, but don't listen to the instrument. You know, at least I try not to solo things. Yeah, I mean, so you do just to investigate, so you know what it is once you yeah. drop it back in. Yeah. But yeah, you just get the important stuff right. And this is like I've had this conversation about the Atmos mixing too, because obviously you've got to match a stereo mix bus and mastering, which can be really really difficult. But you don't have to match it on every instrument. You match it on the important stuff, and then the other stuff can sound like anything you want while you fly it around the room. It's fine. That's right. 100%. Awesome. Okay, next question is from Juris, and he asks, Hi, Manny. How did you get that incredible reverb effect on Sunflower? Is it a delay reverb, a big pre-delay? Is there a side chain in automation? He's smiling. What reverb did you use? <laughs> I love that song. This one. <laughs> Like, yeah honestly it's one of my favorite favorite songs uh you know i gotta i can't take all the credit for that one because lou bell the producer is one amazing amazing producer and he plays around with a, a lot of reverbs uh my job at that point is to kind of blend it with you know with post and you know working on the new post album right now and my job is to make sure that exists in, in the you know that it cuts through some songs and so i really take what he's done and i try to emphasize it or hide it or feature it on different sections of the song but the reverb you know itself i mean he's done it and he uses it anything from valhalla to to uh, you know, we uh, things that we all use. You know, the, the Manny American Reaper. You know, <laughs> mostly, uh, mostly that. Yeah, no, it's all that. <laughs> so it's uh, yeah. I mean, look, I, I love the Valhalla stuff. Uh, you know, he actually uses some R verb uh, that he changed to a different verb. Uh, he does a lot of chaining. You know, a lot of like maybe two, three different reverbs, uh, and we all do. Um, and then some of them, like uh, I remember the D verb works really well in pop music because it yep. gets through not easy to fair. hear mm. easy to hear exactly but you know like a, a bricasti wouldn't necessarily cut through in pop music and i think we talked about it before yeah adding uh, the distortion on the output of that exactly. could come up yeah so i i would say for reverbs i mean just listen to the source you know eq don't be afraid of eqing the uh the reverb just you know if you put it up and it doesn't work make sure it's in the mix and then start adding eq to your reverbs and and i think that's the uh the most effective tool to put it in the mix and eq the reverb you know or if it doesn't or a preset i'm not, i'm a preset type of guy too like just go through as many presets and in the mix you'll see what it you know you'll see what blends in and what 
what the emotional connection is to that song, to that track or vocal or whatever it is. And there is something, I mean, and I'm a newbie at reverbs. I really am. I'm shitty at them. But <laughs> there's something incredible about having two reverbs going. With any one reverb, there will be some anomaly, some thing about it that will make it stick out and stuff will sound too wet. And then you start to bury it, but then it's not doing its job. Two reverbs, it doesn't even really fucking matter what they are. Just get two reverbs up there and all of a sudden they convolve with each other. And it sounds drier but more natural and i mean i've found it combinations of dverb and valhalla or uh, like just anything it doesn't matter yeah yeah so layer like basically just the manny reverb well yeah <laughs> yeah definitely yeah. two two yeah. manny reverbs. he's a buyer not a seller <laughs> <laughs> okay uh next one kind of in the same vein here um would it be possible to explain on how to achieve depth in a mix, more specifically on vocals? I mean, yeah. I mean, to add to it. I, I, look, I, uh, I mean, the most obvious one would be a reverb, right? To, uh, mm -hmm. if, you, if you put more reverb, like it goes away, further away from you. If you take it out, then it comes towards you. So uh, how much depth do you want, I guess? Um, you know, I tend to like either putting a ton of reverb on things or putting just enough so that you hear the effect. So uh, I know you asked about depth, but what I try to do with width as well is like if you find a super tight reverb and then you EQ the, uh, you know, the tail end of it so that it becomes almost like a harmonizer. So now you put it in and it becomes wider and then you put another reverb uh, that's a mono reverb, just put everything up the middle and then that's how you start creating a little bit of depth it's easy to just to wash it all because that's the definition of depth. But, you know, what you may want to try, which I've done many, I'm sure we've all done this before and many times is, you know, maybe the verse is a little fo forward and maybe the, the chorus is a little further away from you. But but when you, it goes away from you, you got to have still have you got to have that impact. So so what I would do is I would. EQ, um, the course is different than the verses so that it comes forward, but then it's got depth. Um, so there's so many little things you can do to create emotion and depth and height and width, uh, dynamics, uh, which is the most important word in mixing, in my opinion, uh, because it doesn't have to be dynamics. It's not louder and softer. It's just dynamics to me is emotional, you know, diff difference in emotion and for each part of the song. Um, so I would say, look, it's the same thing that we all have said many, many times. You can add a little bit of depth with some reverb, but just make sure that play with the width of the reverb is what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to say. And uh, mm -hmm. it'll be more, I don't know, not more efficient, but it'll give you a different dimension. And then the other thing is play with the different sections because not every section in the song will have the, will, will you need that same depth. And uh, even if it's subtle, maybe even if we don't hear it, it's enough to make it, oh, you know, yeah, like your body kind of goes up a little bit. So just make sure that don't just add depth just to add depth, you know, add it to. Oh, I'm always conscious, and I think we talked about it before, too, uh, conscious of the next section. So whatever section you, you're in in the song, uh, be conscious of what's coming next. Yeah, you've got to leave room. You've got to yeah. leave room. There's nothing worse than making the verse too big. Yeah, and vice versa, right? If you're if you're if you're like you know here, you're conscious of what 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 you're gonna do to do the opposite too. So, and that goes, you know, and that that makes it for subconsciously you wanting to hit re, 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 repeat, you know, uh, and that's really what we're in the business of. Just hey, how do we make you hit repeat? Yeah, and having things happen mm -hmm. for sections of the song, I'm it's. The goal would be to have 10 things turn on in the chorus and nobody would notice. Right. Yeah. Yep, yep. Like, that's yep. it. Just everything gets bigger. Mm -hmm. But your body knows it. Your yeah. body exactly. kind of feels something, you know, that a lift, you know. Uh, but that's it. Yeah. To be yeah. able to match that. And you don't. And the, the perfect argument for not always wanting depth is the John Mayer story you told. Right. Exactly. exactly. That has zero depth mm -hmm. on it except the body of his voice. Yep, yep. And, and then you go even a step further. Uh, I feel like a lot of us are, you know, 
concerned about sonic things, right? But none of this matters unless the song tells you to do it, which sounds so cliche. Mm. But, you know, going back to the John Mayer, I mean, the song needed that and the song asked for that. And just make sure you pay attention to the song. It's funny, we talk about tricks and things that we can do, but what if the song is not asking for that? So just make be mindful of that. Be mindful of, oh, the lyrics, you know, listen to the lyrics, solo the this time solo the vocal from beginning to end and see what the song is really about. And that's going to give you way more inspiration too, on, you know, on what to do. Awesome. Cool. Um, okay. Next one is, this is also from Javier. Uh, he asked the last question. I forgot to say his name. How hot is the signal going into the console when you mix? Fuck. You don't see the meters move. <laughs> those like, are those are mix running <laughs> indicators. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I, I smashed the mix running indicators. I'm like, yeah, I, I think it's gonna fucking, you know, smoke is gonna come out of those meters. I'm, I hit it really, really, really hard. Yeah, that's the beauty about the SSL or you know these consoles. You can smash them. You know, you can, you know, you can abuse them, <laughs> and uh, it's rare that they, you know that they break up it's rare so yeah to answer your question yeah. i'm at a 69. <laughs> <laughs> nice nice um so can you touch on why like briefly you know yeah to get a sound you know to get some personality out of it, out of it. you know why do we use a poltec you know or uh in la2a mm -hmm. or you know in 1176 i just to drive the signal to the point of color the, the the coloration is slightly different than what you would get say in the box so uh not better or worse just different just a different tone you know mm -hmm. i always say knowing your gear uh whether it's outboard or or plugins just kind of know what that tone is gonna give you and, and try to relate that to either a color or shape whatever it is it doesn't matter but next time you need you're looking for that tone that shape, that color, you know what to pull up, you know, because there's just too much of too many fucking plugins nowadays. So you, you'll get lost. And and what you'll you'll do is you'll just put it based on the GUI because it looks kind of cool or someone or you read or you heard on it. On, you heard something on Andrew Shep's podcast, and, you know, <laughs> but, uh, you know, you, you just got to like know your tools, man. I'd rather you, I'd rather have 10 very useful tools than a thousand somewhat semi, you know, like no a hundred percent of 10. Yeah. Uh, and start there. Mm -hmm. you know? And every analog circuit, as you start to push signal through it, turns into a limiter with harmonic distortion and they all have a different knee as you approach mm -hmm. the voltage rails and mm -hmm. they do. And digital stuff, unless you program it in there, does not do that. It has no knee. You go from exactly the same sounding fantastic until it's complete clipping. And obviously, no one leaves their digital stuff to do that anymore. But with floating point, you don't have to have that limit up top, whereas analog circuits have a voltage rail. You cannot output a voltage bigger than the voltage rail, period. It's, in, it's physically impossible. So what happens as you approach it in every analog circuit is just different. Yep, yep. And knowing that color is really important, what happens when you, you know, how much you push. And I mean, that, that, yeah. that's another that's another tool. It's and not, that's again, always been around, too. I mean, people think like, oh, it's the loudness wars. There's nothing to do with that. I mean, the Glenn Johns recording acoustic guitars with a Neve preamp was always, you go one click too far, then you come back. Yep. 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 Awesome. Watching Perfect. him work okay. in the, uh, the new Beatles documentary, by the way, is just so uh, great. Yeah. Seen and what yet. a badass wardrobe, man! You're gonna you're gonna change right. the way you dress when you watch <laughs> you watch Glenn. I need to. Shit. Yeah. Gonna have some fancy coats to go into verse with. Yeah. Okay. Next question is from Raymond, and he says, "I'd like to know a little bit more about Manny's process. What's the first thing you look for in a mix? Um, when do you start adding effects? Mix bus processing." And do you use a lot of parallel compression? Basically everything. We want to know everything, man. <laughs> so are elements mainly processed on their own or are they grouped and processed together, et cetera? Well, look, the, 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 in today's world, having roughs, uh, a lot of those decisions have been made for you. You know, I, I can't say that I, you know, I strip everything and start from 
you know, from the ground up. I n never do that. You don't need to, actually. So today, most of those decisions have been made for you. Uh, now, the trick today, in today's mixer, the key is, you know, it's like a chef. We have all these ingredients. How much, you know, how much salt, how, how much uh, acid, what, you, you know, how much of it do you put into this thing? And uh, my approach is just about emotion. I, clo you know, I listen to the rough. That's the first thing I do. And, and I, I used to take physical notes. Now I take mental notes on what I want to keep, what I want to do. So if you're looking at a mixer from, hey, what do you, how do you decide to put reverb on this, this and that, that to me, in, in my shoes, that's, I don't think of it that way. I don't, I see it as an emotion. And I think that's the biggest, biggest, biggest mistake that a lot of people make. It's like, uh, how much reverb do you, how, how much low end and how much this, and you know what? Of everything None of is just matters. a yes. None you know? of that matters. You know what matters is how does the song make you feel? And then mm. my style, my approach is as needed. So I can't say that I'm conscious about how much top end, low end, reverb, kick, snare. I'm not conscious about any of that. I'm like, does it? Does the snare like killing? Pier is that piercing snare? Why is that? Why is it like that? Well, you know what? Maybe the production isn't that. Maybe it's a younger producer and and it needs a little bit of that Tabasco and I'm gonna mind fuck it and give you a loud ass snare that all you're gonna think about is the snare and the vocal because the rest of the production isn't up to par maybe for the rest of the, with the rest of the songs on the album. So uh, there's a million different things that you gotta think about but I never go into it with, oh, I wonder how much reverb I'm gonna put today. Just use as needed the rough. If you're a mixer and you get roughs, Listen to it and see what you can make better, or 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 not, or keep from the rough. Uh, so all those all those decisions kind of have been made for you. It's just a matter of what your taste is like, what you know, how you present it, and how you really really create more emotions. So it sounds like a lot of people are asking obviously technical questions, and that's all good. <laughs> but just make sure you pay attention to the song. The song will let actually answer a lot of those questions for you. You don't even have to overanalyze it or you know overthink it. It will do it for you. Now, if you're a producer, that's a whole different conversation, by the way. And there's a lot of lines are blurry right now between producer and, and mixer and engineer. So if you're a producer mixing your own stuff, that's part of production. You know, so make sure that again, you're, you're, uh, you know, when we do like these mix with the master seminars, I always tell producers like, hey, you gotta almost put that hat on, which and be very conscious of which hat you have on. To me, that question is more of like a producer hat, like you know, that's a production call. Now, when you're mixing it, if you produced it, put that mixer hat on. And then, then don't don't keep producing because the biggest mistake I've seen made is producers that are mixing their own stuff. They're mixing, but they're still producing, and you're gonna just do this, and you're gonna be lost. And that's why we still have a job because <laughs> they're like, "Fuck, I can't do this. I'm so frustrating." And then you give it to someone like us, and we kind of help you finish that record, you know, because you're too lost, you're too in it. So try not to think of it as like. What's your approach with effects and this? There is no approach. I, I actually I have no approach. I have my responsibility is to make sure that that song, and these tools just think of them as different emotion to put into that song, because no one's gonna care what reverb you use at the end of the day. No one gives a fuck at the end of the day. You know what happens is does this song make me want to cry, dance? Uh, hang out with my friends, do drugs, drink, whatever that is. The response, your responsibility is that, not to focus on reverbs and delays and all that. Just make sure you know why you're putting the, some of those things on the record. And I, I always say, is it making it, does it make it sound better or feel better? And you know which one I'm going to say, I'm going to go for. And I, I think, again, it goes back to the John Mayer mix where you didn't know that the vocal was bone dry. And what the, the point is, is there is no point at which you say, now I have to go look at the vocal and see what effects I'm going to put on it. Like, I am as likely to start with the stereo bus as I am with the kick drum EQ. Yep, yep, and I'm yep. going back and forth between those sort of things, which 
when you're learning, feel as though one of those things is very zoomed out and one of them is very zoomed in. They're exactly the same. Mm -hmm. They're exactly the same. You know, and I, we always talk about the foundation. You know, I think you do have to have a foundation. For me, as the drums, you know, maybe because I'm mm -hmm. a straight drummer, I always start with the drums, even if the, there's no drums in the song. So whatever the rhythmic section is, just have a foundation and then build from that and build based on emotion, not necessarily on toys or EQs or any of that. Build on you know, what we've been talking about, what's, you know, what's the true essence of that song. And that's our responsibility, man. That's what we, and I feel like a lot of people forget that. We get caught up in the toys that we have, which toys are just tools. Just remember that. They're just tools to make, to help you get that emotion across, you know? So I, I got to interject a question here. You talk about so the frustrated also. drummer thing. <laughs> have you ever mixed anything with Abe playing on it? And did yeah. you intentionally make him sound bad? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, I actually replaced the drums one time. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great if I like just replaced the drums with me playing? Me sound all crappy. Like, hey, man, my drum, my drum sound weird. Yeah, and if you if you guys don't know why I asked the question, go listen to episode one. Yes. So we won't go back into that. But you so you have mixed a plane, which that's I have. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. All right. That's amazing. And that last answer was so good. I don't even know. Uh, I don't know how we top that. How are you doing on time? Because another five, five minutes, five, ten minutes. I got a, I got a cool. two o'clock here. Uh, okay. Yeah, All right. Cool. Knock a couple out. Okay. Um, let's see. So we had one in the chat after your SSL answer, and um, a couple upvotes on this one. How do you achieve that SSL sound in the box where you're slamming the SSL on the on the input? I don't They're think asking for any tips on that. Yeah, physically impossible. You know, it's just like Rupert Neve said. It's you can, it's a it's an unfair comparison because one, you have an analog piece, you have a signal, a voltage go, going through it, and one obviously doesn't. So it's it's again not better or worse. You just can't. I mean, I I. I I'm the wrong person to ask because I do have an SSL here and I don't try to fake that in the box just because I have it here. So I don't know if, you, I mean, I'm sure Andrew would probably be better well, qualified. But, to be, <laughs> but really, when I switched from my Neve to in the box, it was to get away from all the shit I couldn't get away from on the Neve. Like you, you have to hit it with a certain amount of level. Otherwise, you could use anything. Right. right? It doesn't yeah. sound like an SSL or a Neve or whatever. I mean, EQ aside, like the mix bus doesn't sound like that type of mix bus until you start to hit it. Yeah. But yeah. with that comes all of the other stuff that comes with it. So I was so happy to get away from my mix leaning to one side at certain frequencies and crosstalk weirdness. And just like, I couldn't give a shit about so, trying to recreate that part. I have a question for you, Andrew. Um, so let me, so if you were to have to amazing British assistants that set everything up for you, print and all, and do all that. Nope. Would you go back to that? Nope. Yeah. No, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't at all because what it, what happened was when I first started mixing in the box, it was I just ignored all the stuff I was missing, and then I realized like, no, I really love all that harmonic distortion, but I'm doing it now where I want it. So certain things get lots of harmonic distortion and certain things get none and they're all meeting up in the mix bus. And sometimes the mix bus has harmonic distortion, sometimes it doesn't. So no, I mean, it took me a long time, I think, to get my head around how I wanted to approach it. But uh, no, I wouldn't want to go back. I love my Neve and I wish it's great to own an Eve and I don't own one anymore. Well, I own a little baby one now, but, but for tracking, for tracking, not for mixing. I love my workflow so much right now that I don't feel like there's anything I'm lacking. Right. And I guess it goes down to what you're used to, right? I mean, it's, you know, it's really what makes you comfortable and what you're, you're used to. I, I still kind of perform pr perform a mix. You know, I, I still grab faders and and feel it. And, and, uh, and I'm not, and that's my workflow. I can't grab a mouse or even a, a little eight fader control. You know, I just... You know, I just, I'm just not used to that. So I don't, 
they get yeah, it's yeah. all stuff you gotta. It's that you gotta relearn some things. And there's there are some records where I never turn my controllers on, and there's some records they're on the whole time. Like I can't work on it without some faders. And other yeah. stuff, I'm absolutely fine just using clip gain and drawing stuff in, or use grabbing one fader with a mouse, whatever. Yeah, and that's what it is. It's just workflow. Whatever you're used to, you know. I I feel like when I'm on the desk, I can do ten things in two seconds as opposed to doing 10 things in 10 seconds. And to me, that's like to get that out. Like I can EQ here and do levels here and I can do, I can do so many things at once that I can't do in the box. And that's just not to say that I couldn't do it in the box. I just, that's just what we're used to. It's whatever your workflow is like, yeah. you know? Yeah, look, and it's like sitting down, for people who know Logic, sitting down in front of Pro Tools or the other way around. Like, it makes you feel dumb when you mm -hmm. switch, and then you're not creative because you can't just respond. So yeah, yeah. any transition mm -hmm. like that just takes time. Yeah, yep, 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 exactly. exactly. But I have no doubt that you would be doing hellaciously great mixes <laughs> in the box with no controller if that's what you had to do. You'd figure it out, and you'd do it. Yeah, I think I think so. Yeah, yeah. I think I think you uh, pivot and you. Uh, yeah, look, because it is as they say, oh. it's the ears, not the gears. And yep. I was terrified to give up the gear. Yeah. I thought that's it. My career is over. Like I'll never work <laughs> again. But I got to try this thing, and no, you know. <laughs> <laughs> now I think that it would be so. Then yeah. So then the, the question is: Is it different? Because I try to recall mixes on Neves and it's it's impossible uh but with an ssl like if you were because there is something i gotta say the reason why i have it would be so much more it would be better for me to switch right i mean just flow wise and i mean for all the good reasons but i just have it because of the emotion I get from that feeling that I was telling you to yeah. do. And if you pain. don't have to get away from it, I mean, because you do, you've got assistants who can take the, the pain that away would, from that. That would be my question to a lot of mixers. If they had the convenience, and thankfully I, I'm blessed enough to have the convenience of someone printing stems, someone setting up mixes for me, where I'm just creative. I wonder how many people would say... Yes, I would love to stay out of the box, and maybe the box conversation doesn't exist. If you had the ability, I mean, I wonder how many people would then go to, you know, because I, I, again, I haven't been able to make that transition, and I've tried, but because of, um, I, I feel like a lot of people have had to do it based on that, because, you know, why are you going to pay an assistant to do it? Why are you going to... Yes. Yeah you know, buy a, a whatever, I don't know how much these are, but why are you going to go through that ex extra expense? But if you took all that aside and it just went for pure, pure emotion, I wonder how many people would say, and I've asked a ton of people this question, I, I wonder how many would say, yeah, I would I would do it if I, if those, that list of 30 things. But it, but it's all, it's just about the workflow that you yeah. enjoy doing too. Because like I was, like I said, I was terrified about doing it and I really was like, it was yeah. a long transition. Well, I'm, and I'm sure, I'm sure. Shit, I'm, I'm terrified about but, changing monitors. But the, like, well, yeah, but, shit in this tense. <laughs> but the epiphany for me was I was going, I'm, I'm told the story before, but I was going to Chad Blake's house to have lunch with Debbie and I had all these questions I wanted to ask him, like, how are you doing this? How are you doing this? How are you doing this? Because he'd been in the box for years already, right. like five years at least, fully in the box, had already won a Best Engineered Album Grammy that was mixed completely in the box. And on the drive over there, my brain, fortunately, just said, the only answer you need is that he's already doing it. Yeah. And that's yeah. it. So mm -hmm. it can be done. It, but if you don't have to and you don't want to, then you shouldn't. Like, yeah. you know, there's no reason you have to, to do it. Yeah, it goes back to workflow. I think that if anybody, because we get that asked, I mean, I get it every time, you know, like in the box or out of the box, you know, it's like the most, the most common asked question. Yeah. 
But if you're going to tell me that, like, sonically, there is something that's impossible to achieve without analog circuits, like, no. well, yeah, there might be something specific that you wouldn't be able to recreate. But yep. I don't believe for a second that a good mixer couldn't do a good mix, given any tools. Absolutely. Mm. Once yeah. they know enough to be creative with the tools. Agreed, agreed. A lot of it's what you've what you're both saying too about workflow. I mean, it's it's so ingrained in your subconscious once you've learned your workflow like that. Like you're not thinking about how to operate an SSL. Your hands are just doing it and you're thinking yeah. about the song. And a yeah. and a big part for me, yeah. I've got to say, in the last two years, I've gotten much more creative in the box with soundflow because I'm automating stuff that makes me be able to do ten things in 25 seconds let's say yeah, instead yeah. of 10 seconds but so many of the pain points of having to do it on the screen instead of just grabbing shit have yeah. been taken away and that's huge you know we live in a in such an exciting time because we're able to you know at least for me for per personally my workflow i get the best of both worlds because i can quote perform the mix and i'm also able to do that crazy delay that would have taken us you know 40 minutes to do oh my a, God. Do that box. So, so having the mm -hmm. ability to, you know, the best of both worlds for me is the best time as a mixer because I can, you know, the, you know, the, uh, it's, you know, the possibilities are endless. And we're so like, you told the story, I think it was the first in part one about the Alicia Keys record where like you go in, you're doing a mix. Yeah. And one of the very first things you do is you spend an hour and a half running the vocal through the H3000 because you got to do it. You want to get it out of the way. It's part of the process. The fact that now that would take you 10 minutes in Melodyne yeah. and it's just a playlist and like yeah. whatever. like it's Or, or it's done already by the time I yeah. get it. Yeah, you know? but, but it wasn't. <laughs> but when that stuff was hard, we were still doing it. It just took yeah. for fucking ever flying background vocals, man. Flying them by bouncing them to the half-inch machine, putting oh. a mark on that was two beats before, oh, yeah. hitting play yeah. and record at the same time. Like, oh, I think that's a little bit early. Let's try that again. Oh, second line is different within the drums here. We got to punch that in. Like, don't miss those days. That feeling when you nailed it, though, you're just like, yes. <laughs> no, but you know what? <laughs> it, it was more like, thank God that we can move on. Like, it wasn't this, like, I'm right. a genius thing. It was like, remember, this is the way you do it. Remember, and it sucks. Remember doing the, uh, the uh, links? Uh, we had this calculation with the links. Oh, then, God, yeah. Uh, oh my I wrote God. a time code calculator in FileMaker yeah. Pro to yeah. do offsets and stuff, and then translating that to the 3348 offsets, and uh -huh. when you can sample uh -huh. into the remote of the 3348, and like, oh man, and the 2290 would trigger the sample based on the input. And... Mm -hmm. The SBX80, remember that? Oh, fucking hell, man. I don't miss any of that. <laughs> I don't miss that. I definitely don't miss that. <laughs> It's, look, awesome. you want to know how bad it can be. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hijack for a second. Someone actually made a comment last week when I said something like, it's my show, so I'm going to talk. So I just got one <laughs> just really quick. I was <laughs> editing a mix together. For, I'd mixed a half inch. This was on um, Stadium Arcadium. So it was a Chili Peppers thing, and it was like the last record I did completely analog from two-inch tape mixed to half-inch tape. And I had to edit together Danny California, and they wanted to use – like this version in the bridge and this version in the verses and this version in the choruses. And so I was cutting together between, I think three different versions, but I had about nine edits to do. And so you're spinning shit onto extra reels and you're taping little bits to the wall and doing all this kind of stuff. And I got a phone call and I like an idiot, I'm halfway through this edit and I answered the phone and then I couldn't find the bridge of the song for like an hour and a half. And it was oh. on a reel backwards that in the mind flow, in this creative mind flow of editing made perfect yeah. sense to me. And it was like gone. It was missing. It was nowhere to be found. And oh do you miss that? No. Yeah. Do you like being able to, in playlist <laughs> view, just copy, paste, copy, paste? Yeah, that sounds good. I don't miss that at all. <laughs> Fucking hell. <laughs> It's fun to talk about and you know but definitely don't miss it no and no we get so much more sleep now i mean session people like don't believe us when we talk about working 20 hours a day when you're the assistant mm -hmm. of course you were yeah. I mean, my schedule was 10 a.m till you know five sometimes six a.m for years yeah and nowadays, I got to tell you, they're definitely built differently today because, you know, my guys, not my guys, but I, 
you know, it's it's a different culture now. Definitely a different culture. I don't want to sound like the old guy, but I will. Yeah, I but we both did a lot of blow. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't actually. I remember the first time I smoked weed and I tried to mix. I was maybe 19, and that was the first time and the last time. Because I came back. It was a band from Chicago. It was an alternative band. And I remember coming back the next day and sounding so different and bad from what I remember. Yeah. Like, yeah, being being in an alter state of mind may not be the best idea. Dude, I, I, this a major producer, I remember coming in and telling me like, man, did this mix on mushrooms? That's a bad idea. It was a lot of fun, though. It was a terrible <laughs> idea. <laughs> uh, uh, nowadays, a glass of wine is the, uh, the you know, the most uh, I'll ever do if I'm yeah, and that's going to be near the end of the day, no that's question. Oh my god, right. that's definitely the end of it. Not like when I was, I think I was eighteen. My one of my, my first sessions. I don't know if I told this story. This this producer was uh oh, we had been up for a week. I mean, this guy was oh my gosh, and I realized he had so much blow on the console, right? And he was just fucking high the whole time, and he would take these. 20 minute naps and they get right back up and keep mixing and and that was my one of my first sessions and i'm thinking man i'm gonna die i mean i either gotta do drugs or i gotta like espressos and but i'm gonna die and i was like you know, i was like 18 so i had, that was the first time i had seen someone do blow on the console <laughs> yeah <laughs> and here you are i mean oh. that used to be part of fader maintenance <laughs> that was know? yeah yeah like because little there you know, there was a studio. There was a yeah. studio. It's. I think it's. They still have a studio there. But back in the '90s, they built a studio in the parking garage of the Sunset Marquee. Oh yeah. yeah and it was yeah. a Sinclair room to begin with, and then it turned into a studio. But when they finally put a console in, they actually had a mirror in the producer desk. Wow. And like wow. that's you know that's so, that's catering to the client. You got to check your lipstick. The console at the school I went to, SSL. They also had a mirror in the producer section of the console that when they bought it, they didn't remove. They just left it in there. They might have bought it from the Sunset no, Marquee. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, the That's good old days. days. Different Sex days, man. <laughs> Different days. Yeah. What was yeah. the um what was the disco la the huge disco label in LA in the seventies? Um not uh, Casa not Casa uh, Yeah, yeah. Um Casanova, no. Blanca? No. Yeah, Casablanca. I fuck. No, I can't even remember. But anyway, you know, yeah, well, famously, the summer, like the no summer. meeting took place without a bunch of drugs. Like that was just that's what was going to happen. Mm. Man. All right, Manny. I, think... I have one very quick question left for you. All right, is it's, it about uh, drugs? What are the? <laughs> no, it's about the blue horn speakers in the background. Which oh yes, look at those bad boys. Yeah, those things sound. So Somebody's cool. just asking what they are. Yeah, Meyer blue horn system look it up it's amazing uh i that's my atmos uh rig so uh and then this is this room is a stereo and and uh which i use the tads and then when i switch to atmos i switch it to uh to the blue horn nice so. nice cool. reminiscent of the yuris right. the 813s yep. too yeah yep yep yep, yep. So I'm much better, thankfully. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The only thing I will say, just as a design concept that was pretty awesome, is you know, the, it, they had the light bulbs in the 813s and those were actually the speaker fuses. So when wow. they were starting to light up, you knew you were going to blow something. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. Wow. <laughs> nice. My One of my first sessions I ever worked on at uh, Planet Studios in New York was with Dougie Fresh. And they were paying more for replacement drivers for the Yuris than they were for studio time. Oh, my gosh. I don't miss those. Turntable just hooked straight up into the mains, you know, oh. no filter, oh. nothing. Just. <laughs> but when you have the first platinum 12 inch ever with the show and la di da, like, why the fuck not? Why not, right? That I miss being, you know, not the technical things of it, but just the, uh, you know, it was a lot of excess back then, <laughs> a lot of excess. Yeah. Uh, record plant days. I mean, uh, hit factory days in New York and, you know, everything was just a lot of every, you know. Yeah. Back when that, the industry was, was printing money. 
Yep, yep. So. Printing money. Well, on that note, <laughs> I think <laughs> I think we've reached the the end. <laughs> you go print some money to you know pay for this freaking thing. Yeah, yeah. No shit. Well, we're all gonna get rich off this uh, this webcast, so don't worry about it. <laughs> this what I. Uh, you know, it's probably the three people that are asking the same the same questions. Like, who wants to hear Manny talk? And I saw the question. It was it was actually me. I, I was <laughs> yeah. No, 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 man. The people. <laughs> it was me texting questions like, oh, what would I want to ask myself so that it looks like people are listening? <laughs> no, man. The people want to hear from Manny. The yeah. People do. Absolutely. So well, it's always a pleasure, man. This is amazing. I, I love, love talking and shooting the shit with you. And Excellent, man. It's been great. It's great to catch up. It's a little added bonus for me. Oh, man. And I uh, enjoy the holidays. I, um, and I wish I was going up north. But next time I'm in that, you know, part of the world, I got to come see you and vice versa. When you're out here, you got to come see yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. It's long overdue. I was actually starting to think about getting a trip together to see my dad and then get over to L.A. But Omicron, baby. Yeah. Oh man. You know, yeah, let's see let's see what happens. I think the um I just read that they don't think it's as contagious or as bad as they once thought. Right. It's not as deadly, but it's yeah. like really? Well, and all right, so here's just a little vaccine not vaccine, a little pandemic thing that I overheard uh, an interview with a virologist over here which was interesting to me, which I'd kind of forgotten about. First of all, it was a year ago last week that the UK authorized the first vaccine for use. Like, it feels like a decade ago. Wow. And it was it's 53 weeks ago that Pfizer was, was okayed for use in the UK. And I think the US was actually later than the mm -hmm. UK. Like the UK was, was like one of the first. Later. So that's, yeah. that's the first thing, how much. But anyway, what she was saying, and this has nothing to do with anything we've talked about. I just found it interesting. We got the Delta variant, which has been the thing that's been just destroying us for the last four months, five months. But what I'd forgotten about and what she was talking about was that before Delta, obviously, because you're using the Greek alphabet, there were the Alpha and the Beta variants, which were both deadly as fuck. Like they didn't care about vaccines and the, the hospitalization and death rates were very, very high. But because the Delta variant, which wasn't nearly as deadly, was better at spreading, it wiped out the Alpha and the Beta. Wow. So, like, the best news in the world would be if it turns out that Omicron is 10 times more transmissible than Delta, which it seems like it might be, but isn't as deadly, it will wipe out the Delta variant eventually. So crazy. So that's what we got to hope for, is, like, crazy transmissible ones that don't mess you up as much. But well, hopefully, like hurricanes, right? They name them, you know, they start with the alphabet, like you said. Hopefully, we're at O. Hopefully, we'll get to that Z quicker. Dude, they're just going to pick another alphabet. <laughs> this is, yeah. Yeah. This is, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, but get your jabs, wear a mask, and go to verse, right? Yeah, man. Yep. Exactly. Let's do, yeah. it. Let's do it. All right. Well, well, awesome. Again, thank you guys. Mark. All right, thanks, Manny. So now we're gonna awesome. wave and I'll Good mute, and we'll do the whole usual thing of being awkward. So see ya.